Hey, what's up, guys? Nikki with Calvin here. Obviously, I am back on the set of Jimmy Shaw's Tidbits. Um, no, I do not permanently live here. I'm just happen to be in town. And sorry if the lighting is a little bit crazy right now. I'm running a time lapse on the TiVo Flash, and I'll show you guys that later. But for the sake of the time lapse, I'm keeping the lighting the same. And I also think it looks kind of cool. So, yeah. And also today, because Jimmy's out at a concert at AT&T Park, we have the awesome what the heck is this thing trying to do stop trying to back up right now i feel like jimmy right now every time we do the stream it always wants to back up no pause pause it yes yes pause don't don't back up during a stream we have the wonderful mr carol science from twitter in here thank you so much for joining us on sh such short notice oh man it's it's great to be here for the longest time, my dad's always been like, you got to get Mr. Carol Science on the show. You got to get him on the show. You got to get him on the show. Well, here, Dad, your wish is granted. We have Mr. Carol Science on the show. Hey. So the topic of tonight's stream is because he's a school teacher and he uses 3D printing. We thought it would be interesting to have, you know, kind of like a conversation about 3D printing in the classroom, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I uh, that's really why I got into 3D printing in the first place was I I started out, I, I taught a class called STEAM, and uh, in my STEAM class, we would be doing projects, we'd build stuff, you know, science, technology, engineering, art, math, and uh, I got really into 3D printing because I saw it as kind of a, a future technology. You know, I, I envision a future where kids, thank you, kids will, um, I mean, Everyone's got an inkjet printer or whatever sitting on their on their computer desk at home, and I think well, you know, one day everyone's gonna have a 3D printer, and you're just gonna wake up in the morning and be like, oh, you know what, I need one of these. Let me just throw it on the printer really quick, and everyone's gonna be able to do that, and not just you know professional 3D printers or whatever. For sure, and that's that's a good point. I mean, technically, right now, um, I've got two prints going. I've got one on the TiVo Flash, and I've got one on the A10M, and it's interesting though how over the years the price and the features for printers, you know, back in the day, it used to be really expensive to get one that had good features. And now you can get a decent printer for a couple hundred dollars, which is absolutely incredible. It still doesn't take the learning curve out of it, but it's still really cool. And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot on these live streams and you and Jimmy have, and we've mentioned in the comments how, you know, we have these cheap Chinese printers that, you know, there's a lot of fire hazards and, and they're, they're pretty dangerous, but you know, I've got an ANET A8. Yeah, there you go. I've got a, um, I've got the uh, Ender 3, and I have some. It's a, it's an HTC RepRap clone that is just some cheap, junky plywood. But uh, you know, I would not trade my experience with these printers for the world because I've learned so much about 3D printing, how the printers actually work, putting them together myself, building them. And I just wouldn't have gotten that if I had ordered like a maker bot for the school or something like that. No. And I totally agree with him on that. I used to be big into radio controlled rock crawling. And I have to agree, even though I had to tear down my truck and rebuild it numerous times to modify things on it, the skills that you learn from doing that either directly or indirectly is very useful and the same with the printers. Obviously, if you know what you're doing, it's a good idea to go in there and upgrade things. And if you don't, you'll probably find somebody who knows how to safely, you know, wire in a MOSFET for the heated bed or put in a grounded plug or things like that. But yeah, there's a lot of things that you learn from these machines, either directly or indirectly. And especially when you get a kit, if it's a well done one, they can actually be a very good learning platform as well. Yeah, well, you know, having these having these kids, even if it's not a well-made kid, then it almost uh, you have to spend so much time troubleshooting and fixing and changing things just to get it to work finally. I mean, I spent I spent days. I mean, it it took me maybe eight hours to put my ANET together the first time I did it, and I spent days and days and days just tweaking and fixing, just trying to get one good print. And then when I got that first good print, it was like. You know, the heavens opened. It was like a miracle. Finally, I can actually make something. And then from there, it was just tinkering nonstop. Yeah. And 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 one thing I will say is I, I commend you for your determination and everything like that. But for most people, they're more like, I just want to open the box and make the machine and print things. But I do have to 
hand it to you though for having the dedication to try and get the thing to work and then you have that really good feeling of oh my gosh i got it working that's not as common with people but that's a good thing you know yeah well and that's you know i'm my latest thing has been trying to get my wife to learn how to use a 3d printer and so yesterday i was trying to get her to to slice a model using using kura and I mean, it was mixed results i mean she she was like i don't know if i can really pay attention to this right now i don't know she she's we're very separate in our in our ways she's like i need you to go do this and i tell her i need you to go do this and we we don't we don't mix very often our responsibilities i guess no i mean i'll put it this way though once you have a good profile set up it's really not that hard to teach somebody how to pull a model in and either turn supports on and off yeah, it's just one of those things that I think once people start to realize what they can do with it, they're like, oh, that's not as scary as I thought. And then they, you know, kind of get more interested in it. But the big thing is finding something that somebody is interested in that kind of gets them going, oh, I can do that with it. And then it really kind of just, you know, things kind of build off of that is kind of what I've figured out. Because when you explain to people that, no, really, you can do more than printing knickknacks with your 3D printer. And they're like, oh, um, I need this custom size dog food measuring cup thing. And it's like, yeah, I can print that, you know, things like that. You know, that's when people start to go, Hey, this actually has some practicality to it. And then it can kind of just, you know, snowball from there. Oh yeah. I I'm telling you, like I mean, people have collections of all the Benji's that they've printed and it's like between Benji's and calibration cubes. I don't think that the ANET Facebook group has ever printed something that they can actually use, you know, that it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like every single day, hey, look at my calibration cube. What can I do? And the answer is always level your bed. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's totally true. I mean, right now I've got the modified version of the sticker holder. I'll show you guys the stickers. Um, modified version of the sticker holder for the Sears Auto Center for Jimmy. I've got that printing on the TiVo, and then I got a custom train shell roof that I'm printing on the A10M that I'm using to double check that the uh, PLA PVA is going to work. But yeah, I mean, everybody's different with what they print. And the only thing that I find annoying with that is when somebody does try and go in there with more of a useful print and it gets totally glossed over because people are like, oh, that's just cool. And they just march on, not like somebody's having troubles with the bench and everybody jumps in there with advice or something like that. But, you know. And in my opinion, that's because all the people that are on, most of the people, I shouldn't say all the people, most people that are on these Facebook groups, that's all they know how to do is benches and calibration cubes. And so somebody prints something that's actually useful. They're like, oh, that's awesome. But I have zero experience with that. And I have no idea how to even help them. And that's why I've kind of strayed away. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, hit up the Facebook group to kind of check on a project or whatever if I'm following somebody that's doing something awesome. But for the most part, I just kind of stay away. No, I, I, I don't blame you. I used to be on, I forget exactly which 3D printing group it was on Facebook, but it was really, really big. And for a while there, it was decent. But the problem is it just got so big and so invaded by people just doing benches and calibration cubes and a bunch of jerks. And I eventually just up and left the group. I'm like, this is not worth my time. If everybody's just going to not it pretty much... I would literally post up photos of things that I had printed or links to my videos, and they got like zero hits none, nothing. And then I post up something to my regular Facebook personal one and a whole bunch of people are like, Oh my gosh, you did that. And it was kind of sad that, you know, a whole group pretty much just ignored what I did. But if I posted up stuff for my friends to see, they'd be all like, Hey, that's really cool. So yeah, I, I kind of know what you mean. And it's, I mean, I'm active on, I try and be somewhat active on the Pia Pauli moai group because i have one of those but even then there's only so much i can do i only have so many hours in the day and i can only offer so much advice on certain things but yeah i, I try and be active in more of the useful groups but some of them just get so big they're just not even worth it yeah i'm i gotta be honest i'm pretty jealous of your moai i that really thing, am that thing honestly i'll put it this way i'm not I'm not bad talking it by any means this is just inherent with all resin machines though they're very, very finicky compared to an FDM machine. If you don't get the exposure settings right or it's outside the temperature range for the exposure settings for that resin, it doesn't want to play nice. But that said, once you get it dialed in, that thing will just make incredible prints for days. I just feel bad I haven't had any time to go out to my friend's place in Walnut Creek and do any more printing because I've been so busy with 
pulling out things from grandma's house because next Wednesday is my last day in there. So I'm pretty much running around like getting things out. And then Jimmy's been nice enough to let me store stuff down at his place. So I decided, you know what? I can pick him up from the airport on, on Thursday night. I need to get more stuff out of the house because there's like some furniture items and stuff that I've decided I want to hold on to and bring down to my family's house. And then there's some cleaning stuff and vacuum cleaners and things like that left behind. They're like, you know what? The new people are probably just going to throw this out. I might as well just, you know, Jimmy's nice enough to temporarily store it. I might as well hold on to it and then take it down to my family and they can do whatever the heck they want with it at that point. But yeah, I mean, I, I just feel bad. I haven't had any time to play around with the thing, but when I do get to play with it, it is, it is really nice, you know, and I'll put it this way. Once I kind of figure out more of a stable place to put it, I was going to say, if you ever have any small models that you want printed on the thing, I can't do it super fast, but let me know. And I'd be, more than happy to do a collaboration where maybe you design something or we go from there. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I, and I, I'm a terrible designer. I'm really not good at design stuff. But you know, when I finally do get models out there, I mean, I'm I'm always really proud of them, even though they're they're horrible and ugly. But I'm always like, look, I made a thing and I made this. And I, in my opinion, there is no better feeling as a maker than having an idea in your head sitting down on the computer and making a three-dimensional sketch of what you want. And then a few hours later, you have a physical object in your hand and you're like, this went from idea to physical object in just a matter of a day. And it's amazing. Yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. What I'm doing right now is um, actually FDM printing when I, whenever I can prototypes of models that I'm gonna eventually resin print because the resin printer takes so long. It, it helps a lot with that whole thing. Does your, does your MOI, you think, take longer than, than a regular FDM printer? My a understanding is that SLA was way faster. No. Um, for example, I don't have it with me right now, but a small train model without really thick shells or something like that, um, it'll take about four hours to do on the FDM at medium settings. On the Moai, it'll take about 12 hours to do the exact same model. Wow. And that's partly because the Moai has to print supports to go with the model. But even if I was to lay the item perfectly flat on the bed, which I cannot do technically, it would still take at least eight hours to print the model just because it takes a while for that laser to trace around the model a couple of times to get the right exposure. And then it has to do where it lowers the vat and then it raises the head and then it raises the vat and it does another layer and it repeats that process, which it all takes time, you know, but that said, the quality of prints that you can get off the Moai, if you're willing to be patient, beats the pants off FDM though. Yeah. One, uh, one day, one day I'm, I'm really going to, uh, I'm going to have an SLA printer. Maybe maybe once they kind of refine the resin printing technology and it's a little bit more, uh, I don't want to use the word safe, but it's just really messy and it's it's difficult. And to have a, a resin printer around a bunch of kids and stuff without a dedicated space, I mean, for the most part, I can have my 3D printer up on the counter or something and it's not a big deal. But if I were to have resin, I'd have to have you know a whole workstation, almost a whole room set up just for it and then just have nobody else go in there. No, yeah, that's totally true. Um, I need to do a video on it, but I literally designed up a washdown tank that you might have seen in the uh, Moai video where I was making the side frames where literally I can just take the vat and I can dunk it into the tank and wash the prints in one go. But even then, you still have uncured resin that's now dissolved in the alcohol that you have to deal with. You still have to fill the tank. So yeah, you're totally correct. You do need like a dedicated area just to the resin machine. I actually put down over at my friend's place, um, I bought a tray that you would put like dirty boots in at Home Depot for a couple of bucks. That's where the Moai and the wash station are. But anywhere else, even though my friend's like, ah, don't worry about it. It's an old workbench. I still put down like some puppy training pads. So just in case anything spilled, those would catch it. And those, those are pretty cheap at the dollar store. You just get like a pack of four, but they come in handy for, oops, I spilled a couple of drips of resin. No big deal, you know. Yeah, no, and yeah, and that's the thing too. One day, SLA printing is going to be at a point where we can um, just like, like one step. You know, you click print, 
and okay. within the actual machine, it'll automatically have you know the the alcohol wash and and uh, the UV curing and everything. It'll all just happen in one step. And then when you when the print finishes, you can just slide that little tray out and just pull everything off. No, I'm I'm totally with you guys on uh, I'm totally with you on that one as well. Sorry about that, guys, for the echo. I'm I'm not used to streaming on Jimmy's setup here, so this is kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was actually going to stream on my laptop in the other room, so I wouldn't have to worry about the baby um, causing distractions to everyone. Sorry about that. But Dude, uh, no worries. Everybody's loving uh, Mr. Carroll Science Junior. Mr. Carroll Junior. Yeah, I saw that. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I just uh, I left my laptop in my classroom, and so it. It is what it is. Had to do it on the on the the PC that's in the middle of the kitchen. Yeah, it's all good, dude. I mean, I'm I'm the guy who's like, oh, the print will be done in time before the stream. Wrong. What happened last week when we tried to get the print done before I had to take Jimmy to the airport? It wasn't done in time. So I seem to have this bad thing for timing things wrong. And then when Jimmy was leaving, he's like, oh yeah, he phone streams through the main computer. You're more than welcome to him. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea without realizing what a nightmare it would be to like try and log into all my social media on there to send you the link and then set things up and you know. Well, when I, when I messaged you on Twitter and I was like, I'm logging on now, I was actually turning my computer on now <laughs> because I was, I was like, oh, let me grab my laptop really quick. And then I went, oh crap. And then I was like, well, I got this other laptop. Oh, but it hasn't been turned on in three years. <laughs> cue, cue the mega update that takes like four days. Right. Yeah. Yeah. BB3D is hilarious. He goes, it can't be a real Calvin stream because Calvin's not all pixelated and slideshowy. Well, but it is a stream and not a video because he's not like this. <laughs> Hi, guys. On this week's episode of Make It With Calvin, I'm staring at the ceiling again. And I'll stare at the camera for three seconds because that's what I do. Um, gosh. <laughs> I I don't know. To be honest with you guys, I have never been able to look people in the eye when I'm talking to them. So even when I'm looking at the camera, I'm always looking at the monitor, not at the lens. And there's about like this much of a gap between the camera and the monitor. So it drives everybody nuts, I guess. Well, we just enjoy picking on you, Calvin. I hope you don't take any offense to it. No, honestly, I mean, here's my take. At the end of the day, I know I know everybody's messing around with me, and I, I do get it. Some people find that annoying, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know what? I could probably nitpick other people's videos and go, that's annoying, that's annoying, I don't like that. So, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's the old saying, you can't please everybody. Well, I, I did have an idea to kind of take some of those stereotypical things that some of the more famous 3D printers do and put them all in one video, you know? Dress up. I was gonna get a really long wig for you, Calvin, but now you got a haircut. I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I was gonna, I was gonna put on a pink shirt, do some giggles, and uh, pretend to be Jimmy for a while. Speak in an accent like, uh, like uh, um, Ivan Miranda, or uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. I gotta message a bunch of people though, because I, I want to make sure that I'm not gonna offend anybody if I. If I try to uh, make a video with him in it and, and kind of pick on him a little bit. No, I, I do think that would be funny, though, if you wore a pink shirt and pretended to be Jimmy, because he absolutely hates it when everybody says his shirt is pink because he's <laughs> partly colorblind. He's like, I can't tell what color this is. I'm like, it's not pink. It's maroon. It's so pink. Oh, my gosh. Ah! That's funny. No, it is, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So uh, today, in at my school, we did an escape room. On on Fridays, we have a little more leeway with what we do in in class. Um, we technically only go to school four days a week, and then on Fridays, we have a day for the kids to come in and get help if they're missing assignments or whatever. But we also have enrichment activities that we plan. And so today, I did an escape room for the for the students. And I used Make Anything's Puzzle Box that he did uh, a video just a few days ago. And 
it, it was pretty cool. I, t- I told the kids, I said, if you can get this box open, it has all the combinations to get out of the escape room. But if you don't get it open, then, you know, you're not going to be able to make it out. And so there was other clues too, but they had to, they could either try and solve the, the box or they could try to solve the other clues and get out. So Teresa is wondering, what's the average age range of the students that you teach over at your school? Um, I teach I teach eighth grade, which uh, I know a lot of people are not in the U.S. So eighth grade is basically like 13, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there. Got it. 12, year olds. But that's cool, though, that you were using indirectly in a sense a 3d printer in that application and i also know alkish one who's another teacher who's out in florida i think he was printing up like those cube things as gifts for the students so what are like some way other ways that you've used 3d printing in the classroom to kind of help for lack of a better term enrich the learning experience well you know um one of one of my favorite things that i've used my 3d printer for was we in in eighth grade in our standards we teach genetics And so when we're teaching genetics, we have to teach, you know, these are the different alleles and these are how alleles come together. And these are the the traits that they'll exhibit. Sorry. (laughs) These are the traits that that, uh, they'll exhibit from from getting these certain alleles. And so what I've done, I found a lesson on Tinkercad, actually, that somebody put together where you 3D print a dragon. So what you do is you get the kids all signed up on Tinkercad. They pull up the file that has all these different dragon parts. And then you give them like a dragon egg. I just use little um, little plastic Easter eggs. So they open up the Easter egg and inside is a slip of paper that has the alleles for that dragon. And so they have to use the alleles, the, the mommy genetics and the daddy genetics of those dragons. They put them together and they have to, on that Tinkercad, try and put them together to uh, figure out what baby dragon would look like. And then once they finish that, they can send me the file on Google because all the students have a Google account. They send me the file on Google and then I 3D print their dragon for them. And that's what they turn in. That's their homework assignment. You know, I, I print off that dragon and that's what I grade and I give it to them as their, their little, you know, returning their homework or whatever. That's really cool though. I mean, honestly, being that I did science fairs and stuff a lot as a kid, sometimes I almost wonder if I was back in that age now with the skills and the knowledge and the access to stuff that I have now, how much different things would be. But it's definitely cool to see, though, that you're using 3D printing directly to help teach the students things besides making it just more interesting in general. Yeah, I, I've been really looking for more different types of lessons that I can use a 3D printer in. The only problem that I have is because I teach, because I teach at a, at a, you know, at a middle school, I've got, you know, 140 students that I see throughout the day. And so if I have 140 students all sending me their dragon models all at the same time, I mean, you can only imagine trying to print 140, not just dragons, but 140 unique dragons that they've created and then having to go through after they're printed and um, going back and and grading them and, and everything. It can be quite a pain, which is why I now own three 3D printers. And my wife told me we can't have more printers than we have kids, so we have to have more kids. I like I like that solution to the problem. You know, instead of just going, okay, great, I have enough printers, you're just like, hi, honey, I brought a couple of kids home, so now I can get more printers, right? <laughs> Your wife is probably uh, going to so smack me for saying that when she meets I, me. I, I never thought, Calvin, but, you know, I think you're right. I think adoption might be the faster way. Well, let me count how many printers Jimmy has here. So let's see. We got the uh, A10M. We got the TiVo Flash. We've got the uh, janky i3 down there. We have the TiVo Tarantula, the G-Tech, I forget what, uh, E180, another G-Tech. Oh, two more G-Techs down there. The Zone Star that blew up and the printer bought simple. So I hope you guys are keeping count. That's a lot of printers. But, you know, I was watching a, a Nary's live stream, the, uh, what is it, um, today's 3D print, and he was talking about the number of printers he has. He has more than 50 printers printing at any given time. He's just got a room that's just full wall to wall with nothing but printers, and he uh, he even designed these little table legs that he can mount to the bottom of the printer so that they take up less room. 
and he's just got this big bank of like 50 printers all at the same time. It's crazy. bb 3 d says that he counted about nine-ish printers over here. Yeah, me, all I have is the Ultimaker, the Thingomatic that I bought off Tested, Clyde, the Trinus that uh, Keith gave me, and the Moai. So that's four. I've got um, my Ender 3. I've got my CTC Rep Wrap which is just some junky Chinese something. And then I've got an NA, ANET A8. Um, and then I I don't know if you guys saw, uh, maybe a year ago or so, Tom's 3DP, he uh, created a 3D printer. It was called the Dolly. That was basically like a Prusa um, MK2 clone. And so he released all the files and everything to be able to print out all the pieces for it. And so I went through and I printed all those pieces in PETG and I've got a tub just with all the components that as soon as I have another kid, I can actually build another printer. Uh, you know, when I'm not doing school, if you uh, need an extra quote kid around the house, you know, uh, if you have a spare room, I'm down to play another kid. Hey, there you go. I also come with four extra printers. So, you know, just saying. Well, you can't say that part or else she won't let you come, Calvin. <laughs> We'll just, we'll just keep those off the property line in the car and we'll be all good. There you go. <laughs> I think your kid stole your uh, puzzle lock. Yeah, he stole the puzzle box. He, he thinks it's pretty cool. So he, I, I printed... I printed the little padlocks too. I don't know if you guys saw the, the, the video from, from Devin Montez at Make Anything. But uh, I... I printed out some padlocks because I was getting ready for the escape room and I wanted to have some cool things. I also printed out like a, it's like a, a puzzle, another puzzle box that you twist like a maze. And when it comes apart inside, it had like a slip of paper that had one of the solutions to the escape room. Trying to see if I can find the uh, Dad? link to the. Uh, <laughs> No, these go to your Nerf gun things. Yeah, uh, so Ripcord, Zipcord's asking, is that your dad? Zipcord? That's my dad, yeah. yeah. He's asking if I live in Hawaii. No, I live in Arizona. Um, I'm on the same time zone right now, actually, as you guys, but we uh, there was a there was a salsa fest in my in my area where all these Mexican uh, restaurants get together and you, you go through and you get to try all their different types of salsa they make. And so we gathered up all their samples of salsa and then I had to make it back home before the live stream started. And so my family's, my family's eating dinner and trying out all these fancy salsas we got, but, but I'm on the stream instead. Oh man, you poor guy. You're missing out on all the good stuff. You're just going to get like the crappy salsas that nobody liked at the end. You're going to be like, thanks guys. That, that oh, really was nice. Like, no. <laughs> no that's cool though that you got out and you got to do that sort of stuff i think i had my dad will correct me in the comments i think i had a relative out in arizona at one point but i don't remember that very much that was years ago <laughs> yeah nathan peach salsa sounds pretty good my parents would actually make mango salsa that stuff was killer yeah i uh I like salsa. I'm kind of a I'm kind of a salsa nerd. We we make a lot of salsa here. You know, Hatch, New Mexico has some of the best green chilies. And so when you're when you're making salsa, you got to find the right you got to find just just the right uh, ingredients. And we happen to live in a good area for that. Oh, I'll bet. I mean, the nice thing is, you guys. I mean, it's like being out in Salinas. It's like. There's a really, really good um, Mexican joint called La Costa that I've been to before when I was doing the sandblasting episode probably like a year and a half, two years ago with Jimmy. And yeah, you can definitely taste the difference between like real authentic Mexican food and this stuff you get at the quote Mexican restaurant that's been like totally butchered to make it so people will eat it. You know, the difference between the two is just it's huge. But being at Salinas has a huge Mexican farm worker population and people from various parts, you just get all kinds of different influences out here, but it's really cool. Yeah. You can't live in my area and be a wuss about salsa. I mean, you've got to like spicy food and if you can't eat spicy food, then I don't know, move to Utah or something. 
Yeah, no, that's that that probably sums it up pretty well. I mean, you gotta you gotta enjoy the food for what it is, or nobody's gonna like you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So Aaron's wondering, what did I do with Jimmy? Well, Jimmy decided that he was gonna flee Salinas for the day with Beth, and they were gonna go up to San Francisco for a concert. So if you go over to his Twitter at Jimmy Shaw's Tidbits, you can find out whatever the heck he's doing up at AT&T Park right now. So I hope he didn't have to spend 40 bucks for parking, but if he did, Jimmy, I hope you're having fun, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no, if I if I had the chance, I'd be I'd be watching the Diamondbacks game right now. Man, but I don't know. They 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 started out really well, and now they're kind of losing. So maybe I need to just kind of take a break from the Diamondbacks for a while. So my dad was wondering, how does your school district look at 3D printing? Do they support it, or do you have to fight for everything, or is it pretty much like you bought the machines yourself, you brought them in there, and you're pretty much paying for it out of pocket? And they're like, oh, that's great, but sorry, we don't have any money in the budget to you know buy you filament and things like that. Yeah. Right. Well, this this year we actually started a new robotics program, and the robotics teacher last year got a 3D printer for his robotics class. the The problem that we have in our school district is that nobody really understands 3D printing. They don't understand like how it works or what it is, and so the the administrators are really hesitant to shell out money for a 3D printer. So right now he's got a Robo C2 which is like the Robo R2, but it's got a build plate that's about this big. And so um, he's able to print really little things and they do little things in the class, but for the most part, they just don't get used. And so that's why in my class, I bought the 3D printers. I bought all my own filament. So everything that I do is because I'm, I'm supplying all those materials, whereas the, the school maybe would pay for something like that, but it's just not... Because they're not comfortable around 3D printing, they're not ready to buy into the whole, let's build a whole maker space or something like that. Got it. That's a little bit of a bummer, but I'm kind of hoping that with people like you and other people, you can kind of show them, hey, this is how you can incorporate 3D printing into the curriculum and things like that. I mean, I just recently figured out that over at SF State in the library, I need to check it out. I'm going to do a video on it. I guess in the main library, they do actually have a 3D printing lab that you can, you know, print models at. So I want to give that a shot. And not that I'm planning on printing anything, but go check it out and see what it's like. But it's definitely interesting, though, to see that your school's getting a printer. Because even over at City College of San Francisco, which I'm not calling it like an outdated school. I mean, the buildings are pretty old and they're not in the greatest shape and things like that. But there's still some really good instructors and people trying to keep it going over there. They actually have um stratasys i think donated or traded in made it out their old fdm printer that they had that didn't work for a nice one that's got soluble supports like one of those professional ones that you can like wheel into an office and print things with they have an ultimaker 2 that they bought after i suggested it to the main to the uh, head design instructor over there it's it's pretty cool though that they have that stuff but it's it's interesting though how some schools have totally embraced 3d printing and some of them are staring at it like that's cool, but how are we going to incorporate that into our curriculum? Right, and that's I, I guess that's kind of a backwards philosophy because, I mean, how are we going to incorporate it into our curriculum? I mean, that is the future. You know, you know, you want to teach the kids to be able to solve their own problems. I mean, that's really what I do in science. I mean, I want my students to be able to look at a problem, and they should be able to find their own solution. And the problem that we have with 3D printing now is because nobody understands it, nobody knows what it is, it's almost like voodoo science. And they're like, okay, you can print benches and calibration cubes, or you can print little toys, but how are you going to really teach science using that 3D printer? I mean, I guess my, I, I haven't worked in a school in a long time, but my suggestion would be maybe come up if you have the time, say like over the summer or something, come up with a couple of, when I say, pretend curriculums kind of like you know showing how you can just like a condensed down little game plan of how they could use 3d printing like you know a good example would be say you pretend like the kids are stuck on mars or something like that something that's kind of interesting and they're given a challenge to try and almost like apollo 13 in a sense kind of like here's the problem you have a time deadline if you don't get it done you know game over sort of thing but it really gets the kids to start to think hmm how can 
what are some, you give them, you know, like a 3D printer and some, you know, other tools and tell them, okay, you now have to come up with an efficient solution for how to solve the problem and kind of go from there. So that way it, it, it forces them to think things through, but it also kind of gives them the creativity to come up with their own version of how to fix it. Oh yeah. I love that. I mean, I, I mean, that's, that's really where I think it's heading, but at the same time, it's just so difficult to, Right now, the big struggle that I have in school is trying to get the kids to just think for themselves, think outside the box, because, you know, we live in a world where everything's done for you, you know, where, you know, the kid has to do a science fair project. Great. Then their parents will have a really fun time doing their science fair project. And the kids just sit back and don't do anything. And, and if the kids can't learn how to think for themselves, then they're not going to learn. No, for sure. I mean, that's the one thing that I have to definitely thank my dad, who I know is watching this right now. When it came to science fair projects, there were times where he definitely had to step in and do things strictly for safety reasons, like allowing 13, 14 year old me to operate a table saw. Probably not the greatest of ideas or things like that. But at the same time, my dad definitely forced me to try and think and come up with solutions to the problems. I don't want to sound like I instantly can judge somebody's project by what I see, but so many science fair projects I'd see, I'd go, okay, really? How much of this is my dad works at blankety blank company and has access to blankety blank equipment. And that's the reason why I was able to quote, do this science fair project versus, you know, I actually went out and did the project myself. And I felt like so many projects were more like I had the access to this because my dad had this position and I really didn't have to do anything. I just waltzed in there and said, I need blankety blank done. And I didn't really quote, learn anything in the process because it wasn't really hands on. And that I think is the big downfall of science fairs anymore is like you said, pretty much it just turns into the parents project and the kids in the back with their cell phone going, yeah, that looks great, dad. Let me, uh, let me snap some photos for Snapchat of that. And it's not like the kids actually getting in there and doing anything, you know, things like that. Yeah, the big problem with science fair is we have too many baking soda volcanoes. I mean, and when I say when I say baking soda volcano, I don't mean like that all projects are baking soda volcanoes, but I mean there are so many times that students do projects that are just demonstrations. They're not there's no science, but I mean there is science, underlying science as to why it happens, but you don't actually perform an experiment. You don't actually learn anything or solve a problem. And so, you know, if I have, if I have to grade one more science fair project on which brand of popcorn pops best, or, you know, here's a baking soda volcano, or here's a model of the solar system made out of styrofoam balls. You know, I look at the kids and I flat out tell them, you make a baking soda volcano, you make me a solar system out of styrofoam balls, you're going to get an F because you're not solving a problem. And that's, no, I think, I think that's the right mentality to have is the big thing that I will say from when I did my science fair projects was originality is king. And my dad will back it up on this. One of the science fair projects I did was literally taking a four by about a four by eight sheet of plywood and putting an Audi 5000 turbo fan motor, which is about the size of an average coffee can, like a U-Ban or Columbia coffee can, like a bigger size coffee can sticking one of those on there with a car battery and making a functional hovercraft. That was a heck of a project. And then another year I literally built a little underwater robot using um, two motors that we found at a surplus store, some PVC pipe from the probably sadly closing down Osh and Thousand Oaks and some other bits that we cobbled together. You know, there was, and then when it came to the hovercraft, we tested how much weight can this thing lift off the ground with before, from a dead stop, before it will, you know, not lift off anymore. How long can it run? Can we control how much power the thing has? Because literally all it had was an on off switch. And we figured out there was so much air blowing out the back. It probably meant that we were dumping more air than we needed, but we didn't have any kind of powerful enough speed controller at the time to actually turn down the fan speed to save battery power. But, oh, well, I mean, I will say if I ever got sponsored to do an episode, the two projects I would love to go back and redo would be the hovercraft and the underwater robot. Totally. Those are the two that I'd want to do. Your, your dad says bread mold. Ugh. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's like, which brand of bread is going to mold faster? And it's like, seriously, we're doing this again? No, it's, it's usually tortillas. And they say, this tortilla was left on the counter. This tortilla was in a Ziploc bag. This tortilla was in the refrigerator. <laughs> this tortilla was wrapped in tin foil. Yeah, and you're like, really? We're doing this again? We're not at least trying to determine which like types of mold are growing on here or like which tortilla is going to decompose faster or something like that? But, you know. Yeah. Actually, actually, Nathan, the one that won me the California State Science Fair was actually the underwater robot. The hovercraft actually did not. I don't think I placed it all in that category, but I did win a couple of special awards. But the... the um. The underwater robot one is deserving of its own video with my dad because it's been so long and all that is kind of one blurred memory. So, yeah. Well, one of the things that we focus, we try to focus on in my in my science class is not so much about the experiment, but the application of the results. So, you know, when I have them write their, you know, lab reports, they really are trying to say, you know, what's the bigger picture here? Okay, so... You know, this brand of popcorn has the least number of unpopped kernels, but what does that mean? How does that affect you? How does that affect your life? And how can that improve somebody else? And that's really why that's really why I tell them, don't do a baking soda volcano because you can't tell me, oh yes, now that I know that baking soda and vinegar react, I can cure heartburn or something. It just doesn't work. Well, the other thing is if they're gonna do something about popcorn kernels not popping, have them do it teach them the scientific method of doing it once or even doing it twice is not really scientific buy a case of each and pop them all and find the average of which one had the most unpopped kernels which one had the most burnt kernels and cook them for the same amount of time you know so that way it's science it's it's more scientific that way yeah, we, we teach a lot about sample size and, you know, a lot of these kids, they, they do experiments on color, you know, which if you write words in a specific color, you know, which color helps you to remember them the most or, or something like that. And when they do that experiment, they, they go out and test people, but they test like five or six different kids and that's it. And I tell them, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you've got to test at least a hundred kids. You better be testing the entire school. And they're like, the entire school, Mr. Carroll? Like, yeah, the entire school. Because even that is probably too small a sample size to represent the entirety of the world. That's only 100. We have, I've got 140 students. Yeah, and, and as it is, different people from different areas are going to be inclined to learn things differently based off what their environment is. You know, that's that's something people need to keep in mind. Or say you're at a school that's dedicated more towards kids who learn a certain way. Well, they're going to react differently to that stimulus than general kids somewhere else. You know, there's so many nuances and obviously they can only do so much. But yeah, you're trying to teach them, look, you don't just do something three times and then call it a scientific experiment. That's just getting an opinion. Right. Well, I mean, I tell my kids all the time, I say, you know why it's called Formula 409? You know, the cleaner Formula 409? They say, they say why is it called Formula 409? And I say, because formula 408 didn't work you know and uh, you've got to do it over and over and over and over again before you finally get the result you're looking for or another good example is wd-40 which stands for water displacement formula number 40 it could have been wd-20 and everybody be like yeah wd-20 is some great stuff but it was literally the 40th formula of a water displacing <laughs> solvent that gave us wd-40 and they didn't know what to call it so they just kept the name of wd-40 and that's what stuck and it's like practically a household name these days yeah and and uh that's my my newest big struggle is i guess trying to figure out how am i going to use my 3d printers in the future to help to enhance my, my curriculum because I'm, I'm trying to find ways to use it to not just pique their interest, but at the same time, inspire them to go make something or do something or, or, you know, do something a little bit better. And it's difficult with 140 students to let them all use the 3D printer all at the same time because, you know, I've only got two that work. My, my CTC is down. I still, I still got to fix it. And uh, trying to print out 140 different things on two printers is just, 
impossible. I mean, it takes weeks. No, for sure. I mean, the one thing I will say um, is maybe if you could team them up into groups or you find those kids that you really feel like might benefit from it, that's, you know, something worth um, looking into. But, you know. Well, it's like I was talking about earlier on Fridays, we have a little more leeway to do whatever we want to. And so on Fridays, I actually do a steam club. So the kids that are more interested in 3D printing and stuff, they can pay a small fee and then they come to my class and they can use the 3D printers to do whatever they want with them. The problem that I have now is they're still at the, oh, look, I found this thing on Thingiverse that I want to print and it's like, an earbud holder or whatever, which is great for teaching them about 3D printing, but it's not teaching them about the appropriate uses of 3D printing. For sure. I mean, I, for a while was an assistant in a little summer camp thing. And, you know, it was interesting because we tried to have like a curriculum, but later on we kind of figured out that it was more, the kids seemed to get more out of it if we gave them a challenge where we were like, okay, you need to build a Mars Rover and we have a Mars Rover set or what the kids really loved was doing like a sumo bots thing where you were, we pretty much told them as it went along to make it more difficult. We told them, okay, starting out, you can use whatever stuff you were given as it, we went along. We told them, okay, you can only use two motors, this many tires and this many components. And at the end, we really limited what they could use, but as we made it more and more restrictive, they got more and more and more creative with what they ended up coming up with because then they really has, had to start to think, hmm, do we use our components to make a wedge or do we protect our tires or things like that? And it really made things a lot more exciting for them because then they had an actual challenge they had to face, not, oh, we got everything in the box and we don't know what to do with it sort of thing, you know? Yeah, I've been partnering with our robotics teacher because we want to do something really similar. So we're going to build our own like battle bots, I guess. I'm gonna go get some cheap $10 remote controlled cars from Walmart and strip them for parts. And I'm gonna 3D print a chassis and everything and make a little fighting robot. And so, you know, me and the robotics teacher are both gonna build robots. We're gonna fight each other and that's gonna introduce, you know, he's gonna pull out his Lego Mindstorms and have the kids, you know, build their own battle bots using those. And, and show them the different techniques of how to build robots that do different things. No, I, th I think that's a really cool idea, you know, or another thought is um, you can probably go on, I know it'll take a little while, but you can go on eBay and you can get small little geared motors for a couple of bucks with wheels. Even I can, I'll DM you a link later on Twitter to them, but you could almost come up with like, generic platforms that all the kids use and then you leave it up to them to come up with their own attachments for it so that way they don't have to go through all the effort of trying to build a chassis but you've given them a base starting platform and you say okay kids build something on top of this and then as it goes along maybe then you do introduce them to building their own chassis and stuff but sometimes you have to start off a little simpler to get them going and then once they get going you can just let them go hog wild and do whatever the heck they want really you know, that's an excellent idea. In fact, I could do that on Tinkercad. I could design up some basic things and then they could, similar to what they did in the dragon genetics thing I was talking about, they could just kind of drag and drop the pieces that they want in their robots to complete their design. And in fact, if we did like sumo bots, like you were talking about, where all they do is just run into each other, then they could drag and drop the pieces to their sumo bot and then we could make it so that it fits like over the top of some of those micro RC cars. So it just like snaps on over the top of it and then they could just battle them out. For sure. I just posted a link in the chat actually to the motor setup that I'm talking about. It's um, I'd show it, but I'm on my laptop and it's not what I'm streaming from. But if you're willing to wait, you know, the month or so it takes to come from China, you can get a decent little geared motor with a wheel for just over $2 a piece. I mean, you could very, very cheaply build a little robot. It's a three to six volt motor. So it doesn't take, you know, much power to run the thing. You could even run it off a little two cell lithium battery or something, you know, get a little cheap speed controller or something. And before you know it, you've got yourself an awesome little platform to work off of. But yeah, I do like the cheap little RC car idea as well. It's just my only concern is the turning radius on those could be a little bit of a problem, but you know. Yeah, well, and that's, I mean, 
like I said, I'm not the best designer. I'm not the best engineer in the world. It's just the way that the way that my brain thinks. I think of the easiest possible solution, I guess, and uh, it's probably not the best solution. But you know, if I could, I, the 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 most expensive part, I think, in trying to build some sort of a robot is uh, the the controller. Trying to get something that you can radio control for any decent price is just really difficult. Even if I split them up into groups, I'm still looking at, you know, I teach six classes and I have five groups per class. So I'd still need to build 30 robots with 30 controllers, you know. Um, the only other way that I could do it was would be, I guess, I could have this class do it this time and then the next round would be the other class gets to do it and then reuse all the parts that I, that I do. But even then, it just takes a lot of time. No, I mean, well, one 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 idea my dad had in the comments. It's also a really good one. Is um, uh, what was he saying? Give them X feet of filament and let them and let them build a support to which weight is added until it collapses. The one that supports the most weight wins. So it's a little bit like a bridge building competition. I wonder if you could just attach a piece of filament, just one singular piece of filament, regular old PLA as a bridge between two tables, how much weight just that one strand of filament would hold? Because 1.75 millimeter thickness, and PLA is actually fairly fairly sturdy. I wonder how much it would hold. Yeah, no, that is a thought. Now, one thing I will say to your robot idea is, as cool as it would be to have them radio controlled, it also would be pretty simple to just have a simple little controller set up where you have two switches that are uh, momentary so the go back to center and then literally have the kids just drive by pushing them forwards or backwards or spinning it and then just have it a wired connection to the robot you know it's it's a way that you could make it simpler and if they all share a common chassis that doesn't get modified when they're done with the competition you just pull the shell off put another one on for the next class and you're good to go from there oh that is really smart i never thought about a wired robot but that would make things so much simpler or you even if you had it so, store. I mean, if the, even if you had the chassis, it's very cheap to buy like four pin connectors. And so you literally just have each robot, which probably costs like five bucks to make with the motors if they're two bucks a piece with free shipping. You have that with some wires running off of it and you just plug that into each, each controller, you know, each team, you have like two controller boxes. So when they're done, you just unplug it and you set it on the wall and you grab the next one. It's a way that you can have limited resources, but you can make the most of it. It's a little bit complex to set up, but once you get it set up, you're good to go. Nathan Allen is is uh, talking about ABS forever over here. And uh, I'm telling you, man, I mean, ABS might have better, you know, UV resistance and maybe some temperature resistance, but PLA is stronger. It really is. If you're doing indoor applications, PLA is a lot more rigid, a lot stronger than, than a lot of people give it credit for. Well, I think the main problem with ABS is the fact that you do need to print it properly a heated chamber or a chamber that stays at a constant temperature so that way the previous layers won't constrict as much, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the thing about ABS is not just that, but then you also have the fumes and everything around. And so it just makes it, uh, it's just not something you can easily do. You need to have some sort of properly vented chamber or whatever. Um, and just to have that set up is just really, really difficult. I prefer PETG over over ABS. I find it to be kind of stringy, at least the, the junky Maker Geek stuff that I use is pretty stringy. But uh you know, overall, I think it works. It works as well as I could expect for what it is. Yeah, personally, I am not a fan of PETG. I actually prefer PLA or ABS over it. But that's mostly just because I find it warps a lot. And either I find it welded to my build tack and it kills the sheet when I take it off, or I can't get the stuff to stick to build tack for anything, no matter how much I clean it. But that's just me. Yeah, I posted a, a, a picture on Twitter a few weeks ago when I printed something for my dad, and it warped off of the, the fake build tack on my Ender 3, and it warped. I mean, I, I had it three-quarters of an inch on either end. It was terrible. Yeah, sometimes I find PETG is actually more of a nightmare to work with than even ABS, but 
you know, at the end of the day to each their own. I do have to say, though, a nice go between is actually um, Color Fab's N-Gen. That one's pretty nice. It has a medium printing temperature of about 235, and it likes a hot bed around 80, but it prints very nicely. It sands very nicely. It's got a lot of nice properties to it, but it's not as temperature sensitive as PLA in terms of after you print it, but it's not as much of a nightmare to print with as PETG is. So I kind of think it's a nice go between. I still don't get why everybody's like, oh my gosh, PETG is so amazing. And I'm like, I really don't get it. I just don't. It's advertised as the strength of ABS and the ease of printability of PLA. And and I, I do think you're right. I mean, it is more complicated to print than PLA is. But, you know, my very first go around printing with PETG, I was able to get pretty decent prints. And the only thing I did was just change the temperature a little bit. But it, because it's a little bit warmer temperature, you kind of have to have like an all metal hot end or, or something like that. It, it, it just melts the PTFE too. Yeah, well, Eddie makes a good point. He goes, I love Engine, but it's way too expensive for him. Yeah, I do get it. I don't. I definitely don't use Engine for prototyping things. It's one of those stick and roll cheap PLA, and then once you get the part good, then to make the final product, switch over to the really good stuff. I do like, though, uh, ColorFab's Engine Flex. The only problem is it has this really weird smell when you're printing with it. I don't really print with it very much anymore, but since I'm working on enclosing the Ultimaker, I'm kind of hoping that maybe I can set up a little fan in there with a little charcoal filter. It's not like hermetically sealed or anything, but hopefully if I set up a little fan with the filter, I can knock down on whatever the goofy um, smell is. I'm sure your roommates will love it. <laughs> yeah, the people I'm renting a room from will be like, what the heck is that smell? So I, for that reason, I tend to not print with it. Also, because I have a uh, Philoflex, which is a lot softer, but we'll see. Yeah, so Teresa's saying something about TPLA. I don't, I'm not sure what that is. I don't know either. I know there's, quote, flex PLA, but it's really not that flexible. Um, Eddie's saying he uses NGen for anything that's close to the hot end. Yeah, that's a good idea. Either NGen or ABS, something that's going to take that heat and not give you any problems. <laughs> bb 3 d my kid's saying good night, I think. That, that or get your butt over here and eat some salsa. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you found it. You found it. Yeah, so this is the the lock that um, Devin Montez from Make Anything made. It's pretty cool. It's this is this is number one from from his little series. But uh, you know, he said you know print numbers one through five because those are the easiest ones. And then you can go six through ten to make them a little harder. And I printed number one. Man, that thing took me an hour to get that key out of there. <laughs> well, difficult is a relative term. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> So Teresa is saying the TPLA has toughened PLA. That sounds interesting. No, the kid. It's, every time someone makes a noise, it cuts to me on the camera. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so toughened PLA. Oh. There's a link. Thanks, Teresa. So we're talking about filament. What's your take on that Prusa Mint where he claims that he's holding like 50, plus or minus like 50 microns diameter on the filament, which is a little bit nuts if you ask me. Because originally, I think the original size range is like typically like 0 0.05 millimeters, and I never noticed any issues with it. Yeah, that, and all the all the filament that I that I purchase usually it's plus or minus 0 0.05. But yeah, this new Prusa Mint coming out, he says plus or minus 0 0.02. I think is what he's saying. And and uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I've seen I've seen pictures of uh, of people printing with with some some of some of uh, Joseph Prusa's filament. And somebody po posted a picture on Twitter today. I think that was like. Hey, I think there's a problem with this filament. There's no layer lines. <laughs> and and 
I mean, it's true, I guess, the more consistent your filament is, the, the less noticeable the layer lines will be. Yeah, I mean, Eddie is saying that it's measured by a laser. He would trust it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not downplaying the fact that it's not measured by a laser and things like that. I'm talking more like, is it um, in the grand scheme of things? I can understand for people trying to do really, really precise printing. That's a good thing. But my question is, how much for the average consumer is it really going to affect their printing experience? And I don't know what the pricing will be compared to others. But um, Kevin just commented, it's not nuts. It's a pursuit of perfection. And yeah, I'm not downplaying the pursuit of perfection. But at the same time, I'm always curious how much of somebody's claims about something, is that more feeding into people's into more of the hype machine or is it actually something that we're really going to go, wow, this really made a difference in 3d printing. This is like the E3d coming out with the V six all metal hot and that you can run any filament through and it's not going to give you really any problems or something like that. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think that it could definitely potentially be a big game changer like the E3d hot end. The, the only thing that I see though is, you know, not everybody has an E3D hot end. And why? Because so many people have ANET A8 printers that cost 150 bucks or something like that. And I don't think that, you know, 0 0.02 millimeters difference in, in thickness, I just don't think it's going to be that big of a deal for people like me who use cheap, crappy printers to, to do whatever that, you know, I don't have, I know that I don't have the best quality prints, but I'm okay with that because I'm not doing anything that, needs to be so specifically precise for, for maybe, maybe higher end models, higher end printers. Um, maybe you'll see quite a big difference as far as, you know, quality, especially if you're going to be printing, you know, really small things or really, really precise things. But I don't know. I just don't think it's going to be that big of a game changer for the mainstream 3d printing community. Yeah, and let, let's face it, most of the people who have the ANET A8s, and I'm not I'm not trying to sound like I'm hating on the filament here, guys, in the chat. I'm I'm just saying that for your for I can I definitely could see it being useful for people printing with really, really tiny nozzles, where yes, if you do have variations in filament diameter, that will be an issue. But I'm talking more for your person who's printing like, I don't know, like a giant helmet or something like that, or cosplay parts. Or just your average person, like what you're saying, who just has an ANET, which probably doesn't have the world's best hot end to begin with, and right. probably doesn't have the best tuning for it. Is it really going to help? I don't think it will help in that application, but I definitely can see, though, for somebody trying to do very precision stuff, it definitely, um, it's going to up the game for that. But I, I, I still kind of see it as kind of one of those, uh, it's going to kind of be more of a niche thing. But I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. I do think it's good that we're trying to improve our filament production. It's just sometimes I feel like people can get so wrapped up in the hype around something, they kind of stop and don't think, yeah, is this really going to help me or not? You know? Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's almost like NASA creating a new rocket fuel for a rocket business. You know, NASA creates this wonderful, amazing rocket fuel for a machine that they don't even have, but that opens it up for the future to be able to create a, a rocket that has the ability to use that rocket fuel. And it's kind of the same thing. Maybe most 99% of the printers that are out there aren't going to notice a difference with this filament, but in the future, maybe that's where we're headed. Once we can get, once we can actually achieve that perfect um, layer height and whatever, I think that um, I think that the, the printers in the future will be able to benefit from that. Yeah, and that's yeah, a good that's point. A good point. I mean, you I look at it. oh man, why are we echoing? I mean, one thing I will. Hmm, where are we echoing through? Yeah, Kevin, I do agree, though, that uh, Prusa does need more of a North American presence. I think the main problem with them is the fact that they are a Czech company. There are people in America who have one, but I don't feel like they've pushed hard enough to get people in the United States who have printers to check it out. But, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that. Right. Well, I mean, 
and, and people are talking about you know, there there are filaments out there that are rated at a 0 0.02 plus or minus um you know rating but uh they're always the more expensive filaments and i i can't afford that i mean i pay between 10 and 15 dollars for a roll of filament and that's the most that i can really afford honestly because i have to have so many colors and uh it's just it's difficult but if, if we can somehow find a way to get you know that that good a filament for a cheaper price that's going to open up a whole new world of possibilities my prints would improve dramatically if i could get good filament for a cheaper price no and i, I totally agree with you on that one i think it's like anything else the problem is we've kind of stagnated everybody's like oh this is good where it's at and nobody's really felt like pushing it to try and get the accuracy higher so I do think probably within the next few months after Prusa goes live with this and people figure out that, yeah, this definitely is better. I think we're going to see stuff getting better and better as time goes along. I will say, I don't know what the pricing is, but I do have to say though, that the uh, AMZ 3D stuff that Jimmy prints with, because his machines run on 175 and mine run on three or 2.85 millimeter. I do have to say though, this stuff is actually really, it's nice filament for the money. I have not had any um, issues with it, which is impressive because it's not very expensive filament. Yeah, I bought some on Jimmy's recommendation, actually. I bought some Amaze 3D, um, some purple, and I found that it, it printed really well up to a point. Uh, I left it out for a little while and it's not humid. I mean, I live in Arizona. It's about the driest state you could imagine, but uh, I left it out for a little while and it just turned into glass. I mean, it was so brittle, really, really brittle, just snapped apart. And I don't know if that had to do with, you know, the dye that they use in it. I'm not really sure how colors um, affect the strength or quality of PLA, but I'm willing to bet that maybe there's a uh, something in there. I don't know. Well, I'm going to now pretend to be Jimmy and we're going to do the old Jimmy flick test on the filament and see what the uh, end result is. So this is the closest I could find. This is some lavender. So uh, now everybody just pretend that I'm Jimmy Shaw's tidbits for about the next 30 seconds here. And I'm going to do the old uh, flick it. You got to start giggling. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. This stuff isn't uh, wanting to break. Let me, let me try a little bit farther down the roll, Calvin. Nope. Still not wanting to break. Um, so a farther. So <laughs> I mean, um, honestly, though, this one is lavender, and I don't know how long it's been sitting out for, but it doesn't want to break. So I think that's weird. I mean, I know for a fact, though, that some PLAs are just very, very, very sensitive, and then some of them aren't. But um, like Nathan Allen said, colors affect his ABS for real. And um, I totally have to agree with him on that one, that the dye probably does play a role in how the filament acts, which is why he likes to use uh, neutral or white and paint. Yeah, I personally prefer gray resin and gray filament just because it matches my primer color. So if anything gets scratched at, say, a train show or something, you don't have, like, hot paint coming through the print or something like that, and it takes less, less paint to cover it over. But it... Uh, it does, it, it does definitely affect things, you know. Dad, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was seriously so close to completing Oh, man. Earlier. Oh, man. But, yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean, but uh, at the same time, I mean, there's, there's yeah, kind of two divisions of... There's kind of two divisions in the 3D printing community. You have those that 3D print in a neutral color and then paint, and then you have those that 3D print in a um, in the color that they want the thing to be in in the first place, and and you know for the most part I can definitely see you know sanding and painting and things make things look better, but at the same time like I don't I'm not good at that kind of stuff I don't want that and so what I do is I always just buy the color that I want and I 3D print things in the color that I want them, and I don't know if that's good or bad or whatever. But well, I mean, here's a good example. This I just pulled off the shelf. This is an enlarged 3D fill from Matter Hackers that Jimmy printed a while ago. And yeah, it looks really cool like this, but because I tend to make models that get used for stuff, it's like my camera rigs. I did 
I didn't do any sanding and painting work on the actual rigs themselves just because that was kind of pointless. But for my train models and stuff, I definitely take or models that I want to look nice. Something like this, I would definitely go over it with a couple of coats of filler yeah. primer, give it some light sanding where necessary and then go from there. So that's kind of um, that's kind of what I do. But yeah, everybody's different. Some people want to paint things. Some people don't. Some people just like the print as it is. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with either of those. It's just because I tend to use mine for model making. I find it better if I go in there and I do the finishing work on it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, so um, I think Wellbot is referring to Ivan Miranda here. He says, does that, then you have people who only print in red. <laughs> uh, you know, something, or, or maybe he's talking about himself because he's got one that, a resin printer that prints in red with a red resin. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that I see about it is, Honestly, I think that it's a lot more colorful. If, if you were to print, say, an entire train set all with different colors of filament all the way down, I mean, who cares if it's not painted? I mean, many people who are looking for a, a, a legitimate, um, a legitimate, you know, perfect looking model. But, you know, for me, I, I print things that are good enough the way they are. This is my make anything puzzle box, and I think that it looks just fine the way it is. Honestly, that's a really nice looking print that I can see on the screen here. So looks good to me. I, I do like your comment though about doing the various colored rail cars because it never made it into the video, I don't think, of because you kept on having derailment issues. But one of the guys in the that I've interviewed on the show, Bob Kerner, who had the jungle navigation, which is just this little whimsical tiki themed train layout, uh, he actually has a whole bunch of little rail cars. And he painted them all in different colors, and they're all in prime numbers, like 1, 3, 5, 7, 11. I mean, this thing got so ridiculously long. We actually, he pretty much ran out, A, ran out of rail cars, but B, the return loops on the layout were actually becoming, an, if he had any more rail cars, literally the train would have hit itself trying to go through the return loop. But there's a good example of printing things in various colors. And I have actually thought about doing that having a rail car that is not finished that I run around the layout next to a finished one to show people like this is an unfinished 3d print and this is a finished 3d print to show them what you can do with it. Cause I'll, I'll tell people, Oh yeah, that locomotive's 3d printed and they won't believe it because it's all been finished and weathered and everything like that. And they, they trust you, but they're like, how is that 3d printed? It doesn't look like it. I'm like, well, that's because it did a little bit of finishing work on it. That's why. Right. Exactly. Exactly. My, my friend, by the way, just told me that uh, he told me exactly which salsas were the best tasting ones. So. Ouch, you just got to upstage there, buddy. Yeah. Oh, man. You want me to get in? Okay. So has your kid already figured out how to solve the lock in five minutes? Um. You know, my kid is, he's a little bit of a genius, honestly. And I don't know that I can take any credit for this at yeah, all, but yeah. he is probably one of the smartest kids I've ever met in my whole life. He's amazing. I, uh, you know, from the time he was two years old, he was correcting people. That's not a rectangle. That's a rectangular prism. <laughs> that's just kind of the way he is. Man, you better be careful. He's going to take over your job when he's five. And you're going to be like, great, what have I done? You know what? That's good because then I can just bring him to school with me. He can do my job. And I can just sit in the back and get paid for it. I like that thought process. You know, he can be, you can become the TA and he can become the teacher and life will be great. That's it right there. Right there. That's, that's it. You want to do this for you? You got it. Yeah, I don't know that I don't know that my baby's gonna be quite as intelligent, but man, I guess I just make smart kids, or my wife does. Probably her. <laughs> if I'm being hey, you got, gotta give yourself a little bit of credit there, dude. I mean, not everybody can be a teacher. I my my grandmother was a teacher, my dad was a teacher in college, I was a TA in an adult school, and it's definitely not easy being an instructor. I'll put it that way. For anybody who's never done it. It's not easy. Right. Well, you know, 
Okay, go to the other end of the puzzle box, buddy, please. So, you know, as far as teaching goes, okay, you want me to do it for you, or do you? I don't have to do the whole thing. All right, I'll just do one step. So, you know, one of the things about being a teacher is, you know, every year, the school districts in my area hire probably 30 new teachers. Um, and when I graduated from college, the group that I graduated with had four people total. And so when you've got four new teachers and you've got 30 new teachers being hired, it just makes it really, really hard. And that's why teacher salaries are so low the way they are. Andrew, can you come get these kids, please? That's why teacher salaries are the way that they are is because we don't even have enough teachers to fill all the spots. And so it's okay. So we have a lot of emergency subs. We'll have kid, you know, these, these people who graduated from college, but they're not teachers, they're not certified teachers. And so they just kind of fill in as an emergency status for the entire year. And so it's, it makes it even harder for me to do my job when I know that some of my coworkers and my peers aren't certified teachers and don't have the skill set to be able to do that. No, that's that's got to be somewhat difficult, though, have, knowing that you went through all the effort and the training and everything like that to become a teacher, and then you're dealing with people who, well, they're not teachers, and that's got to be it's got to be kind of disheartening in a sense, knowing how much work it takes to become a teacher, and then you got to be you know, pretty much an apprentice for a while before you finally get certified and all that stuff. And then have other people come cruising on in and be like, well, I can sub for this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. Yeah. Well, we just, we just have different goals, you know? So, you know, we want, we want the kids to be successful. Sure. But, you know, for me, I became a teacher because I want to help the kids. Whereas they became a teacher because they were looking for a job. And so having, having those two different goals, and not being one in, in your mindset, it just makes it really hard to be able to work with people like that sometimes. No, I, I completely hear you on that one. It's kind of like when somebody takes on a job just for the money versus when they take it on because they have the passion for it. You can definitely, you can tell the difference. And it's, it's sad because I'll put it this way. I mean, I know to most people it probably seems kind of cheesy, but the other day I was actually talking to one of my instructors after class as we were walking out. And it was cool just to be able to, you know, talk with one of your instructors and when we were parting ways she goes you know best of luck and keep bringing the good you know conversations in that you have in class and it really meant a lot that not only did she take the time to talk with me as we were on our way out but also the fact that she you know was you know encouraging me to you know keep up asking the questions that i have and coming up with the theories that i have about why we think an image quote speaks to us in a certain way, you know, that, that meant a lot. It's like, okay, I really feel like, you know, I am appreciated here and somebody does, you know, appreciate the fact that I'm trying to put the effort in, in the class, especially when it feels like everybody else in there is kind of just sitting there like, yeah, is it nine o'clock yet? I want to go home now. And it's like, yeah, oh, and that's seriously. Yeah, one. I remember one time in, in one of my college classes, the uh, the instructor got confused at the end time of the class. So we were supposed to have class from six to nine, and they for some reason thought it was it was daylight savings time had kicked in. And Arizona doesn't have daylight savings time, but you know every year around that time, my cell phone changes times. You know some of the clocks that are like atomic clocks or whatever, they change times. You did good, buddy. And so. You know, my instructor, hit, her watch had changed, the clock had changed, and so, you know, she thought that it was time for us to go, and I was like, no, we still got another hour, and all the students were like, nobody tell her, nobody tell her, nobody tell her, because they were so excited to just get out of there, and, and you know, of those four people that graduated from my, you know, little group, you know, for the most part, we were all pretty good, we were all pretty good, but I remember having teachers or future teachers in some of my classes that I'm like, I'm supposed to trust you to teach my kid in the future. I don't, uh, I don't know. Maybe no, I, an option. 
I, I know what you mean because I, I grew up homeschooled, but I was in my dad's TV class helping out as talent and things like that. So I kind of knew a little bit of what I was getting into. And then I started taking classes in eighth grade. But yeah, I've, I've dealt with some instructors who are just absolutely amazing, had a positive impact. And then I've dealt with some instructors where I dropped their class like the next time. Like I pretty much went to the office, dropped the class, found another class to add and like never wanted to talk about it again because they were just like that crappy. So yeah, I know what you mean. There are some instructors that are just downright amazing. And then there's some people that it's like, I think you got into the wrong profession. Yeah. That's that's definitely a thing. And I, uh, I don't know. It's hard. I mean, I, I love teaching. I love the kids that I work with. It's just really a, a difficult situation when nobody wants to be a teacher because it doesn't pay well and we can't pay teachers well because we don't have enough teachers to pay and so it's just oh it's just terrible but the other hard part is everybody's all talking about we need more teachers for the future and it's like well the problem is teachers aren't looked upon with the same level of respect that they are in other countries there's a lot of work that they have to do like you said they get paid crappy I mean, it's like the reality is if we really want to get more people to become teachers, we got to make it actually something that's going to seem lucrative. Not that they're in it for the money, but make it so they can at least live off of it. So they're not having to literally drive Uber for the rest of the night, picking up drunk people to make a couple extra bucks so they can pay their electric bill at the end of the month. You know, that's just not the way it should be. Yeah, there was a there was a big teacher strike in my school district this last year. And uh, it was really a message to the governor that like something's got to change here. I mean, that every single year they take more money out of education and they start putting it, you know, into other things. Is that a paper towel moving behind me? It's it's a ceiling fan moving it on the counter. Yeah. Sorry. Wait, yeah. I my, think I I think he was worried that there was like a ghost hovering around over there just out of camera range or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, my, uh, my, my voodoo spirit summoning session went very well today. So, um, if I'm being joined by some of my ancient ancestors, I am one sixteenth part Cherokee. So, uh, that you know, explains it, it all. <laughs> no, it's just paper towel. Next thing you know, the door just randomly opens up in the back. And we're like, okay, this is just getting a little weird now. Yeah. The the, the funny thing is, too bad. I know Jimmy's going to probably be at the concert. He probably won't make it home till at least midnight. Because I was thinking it'd be absolutely hilarious if we were doing the stream. And then Jimmy just like walks in and says, like, oh, what's up, Calvin? <laughs> We'd be like, you've been replaced. <laughs> Oh, I know. Yeah, that, that would that'd be funny. That's always a joke that we have is whenever one of us can't make it on the show and we have somebody else taking our place, it's like a running gag where it's like, well, we had your replacement on the show and it went really good just in case. <laughs> Don't worry, yeah. guys. I do not see any of us getting replaced anytime soon. Yeah. This is, this is definitely a uh, only once in a while thing for me. I I, I don't know that I, I I don't always get to make it onto the live stream. So, no, dude. Like I said, it's 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 fun getting new people though in on the stream, which is why I definitely like having the regulars like Jeff come on if we can't do it. But it's also nice just to have somebody fresh coming on the show because it brings a new a new opinion, a new side of thinking, a new a new viewpoint. You being a teacher, you know, there's there's so many different things that make it interesting having a different guest it's a little bit like i always like to use the example of when me and jimmy and then um oh i always forget um what's his name from when 3d printing professor i always forget his name um joe larson who was that joe larson yes joe joe the 3d printing professor and then good old danielle all four of us joe was literally a last second edition because we had just met Tom from Tom's 3DP, and we're like, hey, Joe, we're going to do a little hangout chat. You want to join? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm totally down for that. You know, this sounds like fun. I can act like a total dork. And I'm like, great. We're going to have a <laughs> lot of fun with this one. But, you know, it was cool, though, because like I've always said, you had me, who's more of the practical 3D printing guy. 
You had Jimmy, who's more the I like to print things for fun guy, but I also print practical things. You had Joe, who's who runs a little maker space, and then you have Danielle, who like totally loves the stuff that I make with 3D printing, but she's more into different stuff. But it was cool having all those different viewpoints coming together to hang out and talk, and everybody contributed a lot of stuff to the conversation, which made it a lot more interesting than just me and Jimmy going, yeah, there were some tight 3D printers here, and wow, I saw some laser cutters and some CNC machines, and that was great. You know, having those different viewpoints with Jeff, talk, Joe talking about the maker spaces and Danielle talking about how great, how great it is for kids and stuff, it really added to the conversation and made things a lot more interesting. So that's why I definitely like having guests on who are of a different slightly different viewpoint because it just makes the conversation station more interesting yeah the the one thing that i wish that i could have with all my 3d printers is some form of uh consistency you know because i have you know i can print i can print something like this in 22 hours at a 0.2 layer height that it looks pretty good this is on my ender 3 um but then at the same time let me go grab something I can print my low poly dyno models that, you know, full of gaps and cracks and messed up layers, you know, and it's printed on the exact same printer. This is the same exact filament even, you know? And so I try another type of filament, I'm getting the exact same patterns, the exact same things, uh, you know, separating layers and things. But then if I do the exact same prints on a different printer, I'll get mixed results every time. So it's just the consistency of the, lower grade printers that I'm forced to deal with because that's all I can afford are just, you know, it's hard. No, I, I hear you. You know, that's the big thing for me is, and this is a point that Angus from Makers Muse made as well. He was talking about it more like in a 3D printing for a business sense, but he goes, it's great if you have a ridiculously accurate machine, but if the thing is not also reliable as well, what use is it, especially if you're trying to do on-demand work or just work in general, if you're getting failed prints every third or fourth time, that's just a waste of your time, your energy, your frustration and everything like that. So yeah, there's there's a really good example of maybe not having the world's most accurate machine is required, but having a consistent machine that you can work around, that's huge. And that's the thing that I really am trying, you know, before I go and give my opinions on the Flash and the A10M, that's something that's huge for me. Is this machine reliable? Can I get good prints off it every single time? And I definitely have to say the Flash has been giving good prints and the A10M have been giving good prints. But, you know, you know what I mean? It's it's one of those cases of, sure, things will fail eventually, but on a long duration print, will it work good or not? That's the big thing. Right. Yeah. And, and what I'm noticing about the, uh, the Ender 3 is that it just doesn't do well with the tall layer heights. You know, I can usually... On my ANET, I can print at 0.3 millimeter layer heights, no problem. But on the on the Ender 3, I can't go any higher than 0.2. And I'm wondering, it's probably just a, a bad Bowden tube or I need a new nozzle or something like that. But I'm just not getting the extrusion that I should be. No, I, I totally know what you mean. I mean, my my take on it is maybe try reaching out to like capto tubes or micro swiss and see if they they'd be cool sending you something you know kind of just explain your situation and say you know yeah i'm trying to use these also in a school application i was just curious do you guys have anything because i know build tech definitely will give at least discounts to educators if not just donate stuff to them so it's worth it's just worth asking about you know because i will say a nice micro swiss nozzle definitely can help things but you know, for all you know, there's just some burr somewhere in the hot end that's just causing the filament to get stuck while it's going in there. I don't know. You know, I've uh, I've had the idea. I went I went to the dollar store, and they sell these. These are just like magnet sheets, and so I was thinking about taking these magnetic sheets, cutting them to the size of my print bed, and using it as a print surface. And so what I would do using it as a print surface, I could, you know, get a thin piece of sheet metal or something to put over the top. Then I could stick my magnet down to it. Then I could just peel it off and flex it. But I wonder about the, uh, the temperature of these magnetic sheets. Will the, 
will the nozzle melt through it or will uh, will it actually be able to withstand the heat from a heated bed or whatever? Yeah, honestly, those kind of magnetic sheets just don't have the strength that you need. The actual build tack flex sheets, I'm just using this as an example, they actually have neodymium magnets that have been precision. They've calculated out how to arrange them so you get the best possible magnetic field using the least amount of magnets. And then when you have that spring steel sheet, that thing, once it goes on, it's stuck on there. It does not want to move. I mean, you could definitely give that a try, but I'd be concerned that, like you mentioned, the heat would definitely be an issue. And also, if you're just using regular steel, if you get that slightly bent, you're never going to get it to sit flat. Spring steel, though, has been tempered. So you bend it to a reasonable amount, it'll spring back to the original shape, which is nice. So that way you can ensure that your build surface isn't going to do, I'm exaggerating it, but it's not going to do that. And then when you try and print on it, you're gouging your surface up. So that's just something to keep in mind there. Yeah, well, uh, see, that's the thing is, you know, my brain works in such a way that I need to try and find a way to get everything on the cheap, you know, because for me, I mean, I mean, Teresa's talking about a Flexion extruder, and then there's, there's, there's also the uh, the Bond Tech extruders and things that those are just things that, you know, I can't afford on my budget, and so I gotta find ways to kind of go around it. And uh, Maker's Muse did a video where he did something similar, where he just took like a magnetic sheet put it over the top of a piece of sheet metal, like a metal sign, and it seemed to work pretty well. Yeah, I'm totally with you on doing it on the cheap, though. I mean, um, one thing that you could do, and next time I'm down at my parents' house, I'll see if I have any of it, um, is to take that G10, that fiberglass stuff. I think I have like some 16 inch lying around, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's not going to allow a ton of heat to go through, but if you take binder clips and put that down and you put, say, a sheet of um, build tack or something or fake tack or whatever on top, you can use that as a pseudo flex bed. You can just rock it slightly and you can break the prints off easily. I used to I used to actually flex my glass print surface. I would, I would get a piece of glass from my local, like a, my local glass shop. They wouldn't even charge me for it. I would go in and be like, I need a piece of glass this size by this size. And I'd say, how much does it cost? And they're like, oh, we just cut it off of a scrap. Here you go, you can have it. And so I would do that all the time. And then once, you know, I, I'd pull it off the surface and once it was cooled down a little bit, I'd just give it just a slight twist and I'd hear it crack, 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 crack. And then all of a sudden it would just pop right off. Yeah, no, I have to say like the one thing that I feel like really made 3D printing a lot easier was spending the money to buy a flex plate after the build tech was gracious enough to donate the really, really tiny one for my Thingomatic. Once I started to play with that thing, I'm like, hey, now we're talking. You know, especially for big prints, just being able to slightly crack that print around the edges, you can still get in with a spatula or something, but if you can get those edges to go, peeling the rest of the print up is a lot easier. And I also noticed that my print, my sheet life went way up because I wasn't trying to gouge into the sheet. I could just gently work my way around it, prying it up off the bed. You know, I was, I was watching um, a video by, by Neri today's, today's 3D print, and he was giving some recommendations on how to remove, how to remove prints from like a build tack sheet. And since, since the Creality Ender 3 has like a fake tack on it, I was like, all right, let me watch this video. I'm able to give me some good ideas. And he said, you take your end nippers and you lay them flush against the print just on the corner and you kind of squeeze them halfway just to barely get them underneath the print and it'll start to pop up from the edge. And so I tried that and then I finally got the print off and I looked down and there's these big chunk of my build tag taken right out. And I was like, hey, thanks, Nary. Great idea. <laughs> yeah, great idea in quotes. Now, one thing I will say, I was watching Sean from Tested he was removing prints from the Form Labs Form 2, and that printer will actually put a chamfer around the base of the support so you can more easily remove them. And he actually came along with some flush cutters and just went up to the edge and went, and because they're tapered, that's all it took to pop the prints off. So I'm thinking the next time I'm with the Moai, I might give that a shot because I'll take it, I believe it's a number 11, or I forget what it, whatever exacto blade is the chisel type i've gone in the past and i've rounded the edges off so it's still got that sharp edge i'll just put that up against the edge of the prints and just lightly tap on the back 
And usually that'll pop them right off the Moai's aluminum print surface. But I was thinking that's not a bad idea to remove prints as well, using the flush cutters from the side just to pop it up and you're done. I've been using one of those, one of those long um, razor blades that's with the snap off blades. And I'll, I'll just extend that thing way out and you can kind of flex it a little bit so it's nice and flat. And then you can just kind of work it underneath, which is, I'm sure, not the best way to do it. But, you know, it Children, seems to work. Do not okay. attempt this at home. We are not liable if you just slice your fingers up really bad. And I'm not joking in that department. Well, I mean, I've seen videos. Was it was it the broken nerd that, that posted a picture on Twitter just uh, maybe a month ago where he was using one of those spatulas to get in there and he was holding the print bed and it just sliced him right across his thumb? Eey. No. I mean, one thing I will say that would actually not be a bad idea, they do sell it is like, I believe they're like Kevlar or something like that, cutting gloves that are designed, they're not going to protect you in, like from a stab, but from more like a slicing action, they can definitely protect you. Investing in one of those is probably a lot cheaper than an ER trip and potential nerve damage in your hand. So maybe investing in something like that would work. But I know uh, Kirby on Twitter, I believe, uses a clam knife to actually help get his prints up off his lulzbot beds. But as a rule of thumb, whenever you're dealing with anything sharp, as Teresa says, always, always, always scrape away from you. And I definitely think wearing some kind of hand protection, like a cutting glove or something, would not be a bad idea either because nobody wants to get cut. And I've been there and I've done that and it's not fun. I, I would like to reiterate that... Uh when I do use my razor knife technique that I make sure that I am cutting away from myself. So if something slips or explodes, it's not going to, you know, stab me in the face or in the hand. So maybe I wasn't speaking, speaking my, 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 uh, my true mind, I guess. I don't know. I just linked to some, like the first hit that I got for cutting gloves on Amazon. But, um, yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea in my case. Cause I have the flex plate. It's not that big of a deal. But, you know, Philip just commented, unless you need a true flat bottom, why not design a rounded bottom or put a slight chamfer on the edge, say like half a millimeter or something? That's actually a really good idea. You know, and, and that's something that I have, I have brought up every time I find a print on Thingiverse or something that somebody's made. For example, you guys ever watch uh, Fun King 3D? And they've got Xander's Thing Thursday and, and Fun King 3D Xander, he he designed a rocket. And his little rocket is just the coolest little thing. And, uh, you know, I've commented on a video, you know, I've got a little boy and he really likes watching Xander. What's something that I can print for him? And Xander's like, oh, he should print my rocket. He should print my rocket. So I printed it and I go to pull off the build plate and it's, I mean, perfectly flat on the bottom. There's no rounded edge, no fillet, no, no chamfer, nothing. And, you know, in the future, everybody, if you design things, I don't care how ugly it makes your print look, add something on the bottom so you can get it off the build plate. <laughs> no, I totally agree with that. I mean, what I've done on the, it's printing right now, the, um, the tape holder for Jimmy, what I've done is on all the edges that are going to be within physical contact for like the bottom and the back. I have come along and I have put like a 20 thousandths radius on all the edges. So that way there are no sharp edges that somebody could theoretically get injured on. You know, it's not much, but it's definitely helpful. Or as my lab safety basics instructor said, always round corners, even if it's really tiny, always round corners on something and round edges. So that way it's something the odds of somebody getting injured is way less. And personally, from an aesthetic standpoint, I actually like slightly rounded or slightly chamfered edges over perfectly sharp edges. Just psychologically, it feels, quote, safer as well, being that I've worked around metal and machined parts and know just how nasty those edges can be. Psychologically, you go, this part looks a lot safer. It doesn't look like it has anything sharp that's going to slice me open. Right. Yeah, you probably can't see it on the camera, but I got a scar on my hand that I got eight stitches when I was working construction and I was cutting some metal and I, I was cutting and I went, Oh, that was the wrong angle. So I came back and recut at a different angle and I left this big old sharp hanger and I was like, man, my tin snips are stuck. And I just forced it right through, sliced my hand wide open, ended up at the emergency room with eight stitches. 
Did I mention that while I did this, I was standing on the roof of the third story of a big old house? <laughs> yeah, so imagine trying to get down from the third story. I ended up crawling down to the second story window and climbing in. But yeah, be careful, guys. Scary yeah, stuff. no, definitely. Safety is a big thing, which is why in my lab safety basics class, I get really, 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 really irritated when the instructor's always trying to harp on people at the beginning of the class. Make sure you're wearing your PPE, which in this case, since we're working with the table saw and a chop saw, is no gloves because that's actually more dangerous. We're cutting wood, but make sure you have your safety glasses on, your respiratory protection. In my case, it's like a dual cartridge filter mask because I have it left over from welding. And I'm like, sure, that fits my face a little better, I feel, than like an N95 particle mask and hearing protection if you want and then look around the room and there's people literally just like doing this during the demo without safe without any of their ppe on and i'm just standing there like i really don't like to wish bad on people but i really hope you get a splinter in your eye you have to go to the er and then you have to explain that you weren't wearing safety glasses in class and that's why that happened i mean it just it irks me no end that the instructor will constantly harp on people to do that and they could just care less. And I'm and before we even walk into the room, I keep my safety glasses in my backpack. So I have my safety glasses on before I even walk into the shop, regardless of if the equipment is powered up or not, just because that's what I was always taught in my welding classes. Whenever you go into a shop, energized or not, you always have your safety glasses on. Yeah, I mean, and that's yeah, you know, the the thing that I it's like it's like getting pulled over by a cop. I mean, you see that guy driving 100 miles down the road, you know, recklessly driving, almost forcing you off the road, driving like a maniac. They're not going to get a ticket. They're not going to get stopped. The cops never even going to see that. But you, you go two miles an hour over the speed limit and you're getting a ticket, guaranteed. That's just oh, yeah. the way. Those people that don't wear their PPE, they're probably never going to have any issues at all. And yet you who are, you know, making sure you, you take the proper precautions you're the one that's going to get a splinter or something stupid. I've noticed when I wear safety glasses, especially when cutting wood, I always end up getting sawdust, you know, over the top or underneath and it just blows around and gets right in my eye. It's the worst. Yeah. Well, at least it's better than having something flying into your eyeball. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is you know, why I still wear them most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not saying, okay, I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I'm not going to say that when I was in my home shop, I had the perfect safety track record when it came to doing things. My attitude is if it's your private shop, you're allowed to do whatever the heck you want in it. But if you have people over or you're in somebody else's shop, always wear your PPE. Just just do it. It, it really, if there's anything that shows that you're serious about what you're doing, it's wearing your proper PPE, even when nobody prompts you to do it. It just sends the right impression that, yes, I have been trained to do this properly and I know what I'm doing. So um, a couple of things brought up by Teresa. So number one, she's asking if the stream is derping. It, am I lagging or anything? No, I, I think for a second there, things got a little bit iffy. But you got to remember, the signal has to go all the way to Australia to get to her. And they're known for not having the best Internet. So... I mean, the fact that I, I will say that the fact that people can and other countries can even watch us blows me away. So it could have just been something in the transmission system that got a little bit mixed up, but it's been running pretty good. There's been a couple of times where I'd noticed it's lagging a little bit or the quality's dipped, but it's definitely not like when I was back at home where it's like, wait, can you guys still hear me? Is it still working? Because <laughs> my internet just like dipped out and then came back on again like a minute later. For me, it blows my mind that somebody from another country would even want to watch me. But uh, the, the other thing that she brought up is she says she's currently printing on netting, so she should be able to get parts off easily. And I'm curious if she's making some sort of 3D printed fabric. Is that what's going on? I have no clue, but I, I saw a little while ago, I think it was Barb, the uh, 3D, the lady who sells like the little mini spools of flexible filament. She posted a link to somebody's Indestructible where they were actually talking about printing on, you know, kind of like in those ballerina dresses for kids, how they have like that really delicate netting stuff on them to kind of like puff them up a little bit. A tool? Yeah, tool. Yeah, that stuff. 
they, the lady actually showed how it's not super easy to do because the stuff's really fragile, but she actually printed some really cool like eye mask things that you'd have at like a Victorian ball or something like that in that style on that and trimmed it. And it actually looked really, really cool. I'm like, that's an interesting thought. So I'm really not sure. One thing I have wanted to do on a larger format printer eventually is, or even on the Ultimaker, we did print my logo onto just like a plain t-shirt and like Engen Flex, maybe make it like one or two layers thick. That would be pretty funny. Have you seen uh, RC Lifon do that? No, but I've heard of people doing it. I've seen what David Shuri has done where he'll use like the tool or something else to print like scales for a uh, cosplay prop or something. And it looks just absolutely incredible. I, I saw a, um, I saw someone on one of Joel's videos when he was doing like a bunch of interviews at a maker fair he went to. And one of the things they did was they printed a layer or one or two layers on the print bed. Then they paused the print, laid the fabric over the top of it, and then continued the print so it would melt the plastic through the fabric and seal it from both sides. I think that might have been David Shorey because I know he's kind of the guy that was like, I don't know if he exactly created the concept of it, but he's like the one who's wrong with it the most and is like the most public person about it. So yeah, that's, I think it was probably David Shorey. And Teresa said she's actually doing just what we were saying, printing spikes on Tool right now. Please post up some photos of that to Twitter, Teresa, and link it in the uh, chat below. I am genuinely curious to see how that turns out for you. Yeah, me too. That looks awesome. Yeah, that's something I've wanted to do, but I've never really had like a pressing need to try it out i mean i still want to do the shirt thing eventually but we'll we'll get to that when we get to that well i need i need to make myself a logo i want to make a maker coin but i still don't have a logo for my channel and i just man you got your your cool gear and then you know everyone's got some sort of a cool thing and i need i need to come up with my own logo last year i had my students try and draw some designs you know what they thought a cool logo would be for me but I don't know. I haven't been able to put it on a uh, make a coin quite yet. No, I hear you. I mean, the funny thing is I actually showed my uh, visual communication instructor um, a photo of my maker coin. And she, she actually, she commented, she goes, Oh my gosh, she had to use that as the script, but she actually really, really liked the gear logo. She goes, that's actually really cool. And I mentioned because I like mechanical things, gear just made sense to me. It's a very easily recognizable thing. I actually designed up a coin for, um, I think it was, oh, I forget. It wasn't BV3D. It was another Canadian guy that I ended up meeting out at Maker Fair. And I can't remember off the top of my head, but I ended up running into him. And he was like super stoked that I made him a coin. I designed it in um, Fusion 360, but it was just a simple hex shape that had the hex pulled out to the same height as lettering. I mean, you could even literally just make your coin say like Mr. Carroll's science or something like that. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of different things like that are, are possible. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, for my logo, I'm thinking about maybe like a, like a flask or like an Erlenmeyer flask with some bubbles coming off the side with make Mr. Carroll's science kind of on the side next to it or whatever. Yeah. That would be really cool. But I just see outside. It's blocking me from getting Man. to the The puzzle struggle is real, let me tell you. <laughs> Nobody pay attention to the fact that it's almost 10 o'clock and my son's not in bed yet. It's all good. <laughs> I just realized how late it is. We've been going for almost two hours over here. That's the yeah. thing when you're streaming, guys, is you get so wrapped up in it. Literally, time just seems to like fade away. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, this this kid, he's he'll stay up late one day, and then he'll take a big old long nap the next day, and then he'll stay up until forever late. Luckily, he's only got preschool three days a week, and Friday and Saturday are not one of those three days. Well, lucky for him. Thankfully for me, I only have classes Monday, Tuesday, and part of Wednesday, so it's like, yay! Hey, so you get a long weekend every week then, huh? 
it's nice because around on uh, Veterans Day weekend, I'm actually going to drive down to my parents' house in Southern California to drop off, you know, bedding and things that I don't need to be storing in poor Jimmy's camp spare camper out here. But it's nice because all my classes start at 1230 and then go on in the afternoon. So it's nice because it, for me, it makes sense. I leave, I leave class on Wednesday, go down to Jimmy's and then sort through the last of the stuff that's there. Then probably Thursday morning, hit the road and it's only about six hours from his house to my parents if that without traffic so it's nice because i get a I get a head start on things and also um when i get down there if i want to stay for later on sunday i can do that because technically i don't have any classes on monday so i can just go back to the room that i'm renting and crash if i need to but it kind of buys me some extra time and then i think about a week later i'm going to fly down for thanksgiving but that's no big deal so how far are you from from Jimmy's house? Like in where San, you're in San Francisco, it's about a two hour drive. I think it's about one hundred and twenty miles. I can I can look it up. Give me a sec here, because I picked him up from the airport the other night. It took about an hour to get from um, where I from my grandmother's house to his place to get to the airport and then another hour to get down. Let me see. Driving wise, it is, it's just over, this is 101 miles. So without traffic, it's only about an hour and 45 minutes. Hmm. Yeah. Well, about saying that he might try and whip me something up. Well, that would be awesome. If you, if, if you found some sort of a, if you created some sort of an image like an SVG that I could drop into Fusion and, and design a coin around. I've got a few ideas that I've built up in Fusion, but all of my ideas were so so complex that they wouldn't print in one piece unless I, I guess, took that image and just kind of engraved it over the top of the coin. But Yeah, from, from Jimmy's house to my parents' house, it's about 285 miles, which is only about four and a half, five hours, according to Google Maps, which really isn't that bad. Well, I just know you've been at Jimmy's for a while. You've been working on the, uh, the, the M10 and you've been, you know, doing some videos and stuff over there. And so just made me wonder if you're just like constantly driving well, two hours yeah. back and forth. Well, what happened last week is I ended up staying a day later so I could take him to San Jose airport so he could fly out to Chicago for work. Because originally I was going to leave on Sunday afternoon but then i'm like oh because he wasn't exactly sure how he's going to get to the airport i'm like well if you're cool with me staying another night in the camper i'm like i'll just drive you up to san jose on my way back to san francisco it's like right there it's i literally passed by the airport on my trip back and he goes if you don't mind i'm like dude it's not a big deal at all i don't mind which worked out really good because it yeah. saved his wife having beth having to drive from salinas to the airport to drop him off to then go back he had like a six or seven a.m. flight, so we left Salinas at like three something in the morning, so we could get to the airport around four or four thirty to go through security, which was easy. Then I got home around like six in the morning and went to bed for a while, and then woke up and went to school. But I managed to pull it off, and then he came back on Thursday, so I picked him up on Thursday so I could drop off some stuff over it um, down here because the thing is. There's a lot of stuff that's at the house that's worth keeping, like the microwave and the vacuum cleaner. And there's a whole right. bunch of bedding and other stuff that my mom left behind for me, thinking I was going to land in the dorms, but I didn't. I ended up rent, finding a room to rent on homestay. So that's not bad. But the problem is the bedding I have is twin bed size and the bed that's in the room that I'm renting is a double. So that's not going to work. So bedding and stuff takes up a lot of space and there's cleaning supplies and things like that at the house and fire extinguishers that are still good. Pretty much what I'm doing is I'm going through and taking out all the stuff that I'm like, yeah, I don't think the new people are going to need this. Things that were left behind from the move. And I'm like, you know what? This stuff is worth taking down when I go down to visit my family on Veterans Day. I still have this nice desk thing that's in, in the bedroom that's really grown on me over time that my one of my relatives didn't want. And since the room that I'm renting already has a desk, there's no point in bringing it with me. So there's, there's things like that, which just eat up a lot of space in the car that I've been taking down. But uh, next Wednesday is going to be my last day in the house. And then I don't move into the new place until 
um, Sunday. So yeah, I'm going to be down at Jimmy's one more time, but I, I can't thank the guy enough for letting me not only store my stuff down here, but also just letting me crash. I mean, I have to say Jimmy and Beth are like second parents at this point. They are, they are some absolutely amazing people. And I, I'm like, I can't thank them enough. They're like, Jimmy's all like, Oh, don't worry about it. It's, it's fun having you down here, you know? And I'm like, dude, you don't know how much this means, but it takes a lot of stress off me as well because being up at the house during the whole escrow thing is somewhat stressful because even though technically the office should notify me if anybody's coming over, I don't trust them on that. And the last time I'm over there, it's kind of like, oh, well, less that I have to stress out about like somebody walking in on me, which I've had happen back when the house was open for viewing. I had people walking in after before and after hours. And I'm like, what the heck are you doing here? Did you read the paperwork that said this is after hours? This is what I really wanted to do, but I acted professional about it. But I was definitely pretty ticked off about it. So just not having to worry about that is like really nice. You know, I... I grew up in a home where, you know, we never, we never really wanted for anything, but that's mostly because we never knew that we were poor. <laughs> My parents just didn't talk about money with us, you know? And so I remember the first time that I realized that we didn't have money and it was one day we were getting ready to move. We were packing up all of our stuff and I didn't really know why we were moving. Um, but as we're sitting there packing stuff up, all of a sudden I hear some noise outside and we open the door. And there's a locksmith drilling out the locks to our door where we're getting our house foreclosed on. And we just had no idea because my it's just something that my my parents would always, you know, shield us from that, protect us from that. And so I didn't know that we were wanting for anything. Um, but at the same time, I, I feel like I had a blessed childhood because of it. No. And honestly, one thing I will say that I've definitely learned from this whole moving process of, oh my gosh, how many vehicles did it take? Now, mind you, some of this stuff was n not my stuff. I mean, I, I really, I mean, it literally took us, and I'm not saying also that the U-Hauls were not as full as they could have been, but it took us three 15 foot U-Hauls, one 20 foot U-Haul, which about half of that was furniture for a relative, which I'm glad we got the 20 foot, even though it was the truck from hell. And then one rented Dodge Grand Caravan, and there was still stuff left behind to move things out of my grandmother's house. And part of the thing that made it difficult is my grandmother's like, I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. And I'm just like, Oh really? You know, but the thing that I've definitely learned in this whole move thing is yes, I definitely have stuff like my CNC machines and my 3d printers and my train stuff that that's stuff that I can't get rid of either because it's worth a lot of money and replacing it is something that I can't do at this point or it's stuff that has a lot of significance to me, so it's worth holding on to. But the thing that I've definitely learned in this is, man, I have a whole bunch of crap and some of this I'm just never gonna use or never used. I ended up giving it some of it away to friends, like I gave um, Ashley from Chip Builds my welder that I didn't need anymore. I also gave her my metal cutting bandsaw, which the reality is I'm not gonna be using that stuff for a long time while I'm in school. I'm, I'm saving my CNC machine. I gave a couple of things to Tamara, who's, who was part of, I think, um, Sijinx on Science Channel, which was cool to get to meet her. Gave her some stuff for her shop that she's starting up and then gave some stuff to other people. But it was kind of like, you know what, for what it would take for me to try and sell this, I might as well just give it away to people who I know can use this stuff and can benefit from it. And it just felt better. And it was also easier than like trying to truck it all to like a restore store or a Craig to a Goodwill and having going, well, we don't really want this. We really don't want that. We don't want that. And I'm just like, it's just something that you value. And so it's one of those where to have them just throw the things that you value out as trash and just, man, yeah, and, and I'm not saying I have anything against those stores. I mean, the restore store pretty much provided half the crap for my sister's tiny house project. And I think what they do is awesome. It's just, yeah, when you, when you take something there and then you find out that they're just going to throw it out anyways, you're just like, yeah, no, I'll just give it to a friend who can use it. And I also figured it's like some of these people just could not afford to get this stuff. And I have no need for it anymore. It's like the welder was free. It works, but it's nothing super great. And I was like, you know what? I just feel better passing it on to somebody that I know can use it versus burning my dad with storing yet more stuff, you know? Right. You know, you know I, uh, I'm really hoping that next year 
at uh, Maker Fair, I'll be able to, to come over to California Way and uh, and see you guys, meet you guys in person. For I'm, sure. I'll to I, mean, I don't know if it's easier for you to fly or it's easier for you to drive. But one thing I will say is um, as it gets closer to that, keep your eyes out or if you're up for it, sign up for Southwest Airlines um, to be on their email mailing list because sometimes they have some ridiculously cheap sales on flights. And if you fly into Oakland Airport, it's pretty easy to go from there to get over into San Francisco and flights to there are pretty cheap. Um, I would definitely look into that. It's like for going down around Thanksgiving, my mom was able to get a flight one way for me for like $39 when normally they're about 49, 59 bucks each way. I was like, you can't even drive it for that cheap. And Amtrak wants like 50, 60 bucks for the cheapest train. So, you know, it's upside down. It's on the wrong side. You need to flip it over, put it, it's going this way. Yeah, and, and that's that's the thing is traveling is so expensive anymore. And so, you know, I would fly or I would drive either way. Driving is probably about 11 hours from here. Same with Vegas. If I were to go up to Vegas, that's like 11, 12 hours. And so, I don't know. We need to get something over here in Phoenix. What's wrong with you guys? How come we haven't planned this shit? <laughs> well, Phoenix, I'll put, I'll put it in the biggest city in the country, man. Oh, I know. Honestly, though, I'm, I'm, I really want to try and make C Dub West Coast Rep Rap Fest a thing. It's just finding somewhere to hold it is the tricky part. You know, it's it's finding that it's finding somewhere that we can hold it. But you know, it'll it'll happen when it happens. But I definitely want to try and hold it. But part of me goes, it's almost like Jimmy likes going on road trips. Part of me's like, well, maybe we could just do like a little road trip thing and just like hold C-Dub Rep Rep Fast somewhere like in your town or something just to say that we held it. And then, and then tag matter hackers and be like, yo, why y'all not hosting it there? We just did it. Mr. Kill science. Yeah. Where are you at? <laughs> yeah, no, that would be, that'd be awesome. But I know, I know there's some, there's some places around here that that would be perfect. There's some, there's some little warehouses and stuff that I'm sure we'd be able to rent out for a day or two and for, I mean, cheap, or we might even just find a place that's just got, um, you know, we, we might even find some place that's out in the middle of a, of a cotton field. That's got a big garage or a big barn or something. That'd be perfect. Oh, you know what? I work for, I don't work for them. I volunteer with, uh, the Mount Grime International Observatory. I give tours of the large binocular telescope, the biggest telescope in the world. Oh, and at, at Discovery Park, where where we run all the tours out of, they have a big barn that they use for um, meetups and stuff. For like, they do like uh, proms and stuff there all the time. That might be a perfect place to do it. They would probably get me a huge discount for renting it out too. Dude, seriously, the fact that you mentioned the LBT, have you ever heard of the show Big, Bigger, Biggest on Science Channel? Never. Okay, I'll have to send you the link to it if I can find it on YouTube. Um, there's an episode where they're talking about the history of what made the LBT possible. That would seriously be like the most epic location to hold it at just to start it out. Even if it never, never happened again, just to say that you held it on the same grounds as like the world's biggest telescope would be nuts. Well, the world's biggest telescope's up on the top of the mountain. We'd be more at the barn down at the base of the mountain, like base camp. Yeah, but, but still, being in that proximity, it'd be almost like holding C. Deb yeah. Rep Fast at like the Griffith Park Observatory or something like that. It's just being in that vicinity would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that. That's a good idea. I can definitely look into that. If we can come up with a date, I can talk to my buddies that, that are there and I'm sure we can figure something out. Yeah, and if you ever come down this way, I'll hook you up with a free tour at the observatory again. It's sweet. There's, Dude, that there's would be telescopes up there and they're awesome. Would I mean, I guess my big question is, would they mind if I filmed it? Oh, absolutely not. Go ahead, go ahead. That'd be great. I've, I've, had, I've had the idea of making a video for ever where i just i just go in and video the whole entire tour you know or me giving the tour because i'm one of the tour guides and it would sure absolutely in fact that would be a great collaboration project calvin you and i 
Oh we yeah. I mean, you're giving me ideas. I mean, I'll, I'll message you privately about it. I'm not really sure what my schedule is going to be like around Thanksgiving, but I also have to see how things are, um, how much time I have between when school ends right before Christmas and when school starts up again. But that would be a really fun trip. Yeah, that would be sweet, man. And I, I don't have a spare bedroom, but I got a couple couches and you'd be welcome to, to, to crash on the couch if you, if you came out. Dude, when I was visiting my friends in Florida, they're like, sorry, we just have a futon. I'm like, yeah, your futon is probably way better than the horsehair and a box spring mattress that I sleep on. And sure enough, it was. <laughs> so you're welcome whenever, man. Just send me, send me a message and we'll see if we can find some. That'll be sweet. Dude, that would be, that would be fun. Load, load, load Jimmy and Beth up in one car and me and Danielle in another. And we just make it like a high speed run for out there. <laughs> yeah, for real. That'd be sweet. I could get, I could for sure get you guys, get you guys up there. Yeah. And we do tours of all three observatories up on the mountain. So. Oh, wow. That would be fun. Cause I also have somebody in the mall train community. I forget which area of Arizona he's in. He's like in some pretty small town, but I've always wanted to go out and visit him as well. Cause I've done a lot of 3d printing work for him. So it definitely kind of be like a tour of everybody in the area, you know, sort of thing. So it wouldn't just be like a, one-stop deal just to try and make it a little more worthwhile but that's that's good to know it's definitely something i'll look into because that does sound like a lot of fun yeah Teresa, he definitely should be in bed at this point but uh, he's become obsessed with this puzzle oh, i'm distracting him sorry <laughs> go to the other room kid go on go to bed Oh man, let me go check up on how much more time the flash has got left on it real quick. Oh, it's almost done. Wait. Here, let me uh let me kind of show you guys what's going on over here real fast. So um right whoop right that okay. Wow, this is crappy. So right there, we have the A10M doing a um, PVA PLA print, and I'll post a photo of that later. And then somewhere over here, where is it? Sorry for making you guys motion sick. I'm trying to move this thing without losing it. There we go. That is the tape holder for the um, Sears auto stickers. That thing is looking absolutely incredible. What materials are you using, Calvin, for those? Well, I mean, you're using the PVA PLA, right? Which that mixing hot end seems like it has lots of strings, like it leaks a lot. Is that true or? Yeah, the PVA PLA, the PVA is kind of known for stringing a little bit. But in this application, since it's just going to dissolve away, it's not anything that I'm worried about. I mean, I've seen prints done on other machines with PVA and it still strings. Um, it's definitely pretty hygroscopic, but I think for the short amount of time that it's been sitting out, it's not really going to make that big of a difference. What I'm more curious with on the A10M is, can you do a PVA PLA print on the thing that's of decent quality? Because I'm curious for the price point, is it good for model train people who want to prototype things, but they want to have a good machine that can do dissolving supports? And there's other support materials like scaffold or ABS and hips or things like that. But I decided to stick with the PLA PVA because that's the simplest. But um, so far, so good. It's taken a little bit of tuning to get it worked out, but I think it's doing pretty good so far. So we'll see. I'm wondering about when the PLA and the PVA mix in the nozzle and you have kind of that bleed as, as it's coming out through the print, if that PLA PVA mixture is going to affect the the outside surface finish of the model when you try to rinse off all the supports well i don't know if you saw it or not but on the print um let me see if i can call it up and simplify 3d yeah i can I'll, I'll hold the laptop up so you can see it cheesy screen share ensuing but um what i what it will do when it's oh that really <laughs> isn't working fail okay there we go so what you can see is right there is what's called a purge block that what it will do is when it changes out the materials it will flip to that and then it will run out whatever's in there 
So if it was running PVA for one layer, it'll go over to there and, and purge using PLA and vice versa. Right. Well, I mean, and and I get that, but I what I'm what I'm curious more about is, I know you were saying that you were using quite a small purge block that maybe it wasn't quite getting all the material out. And so if you were mixing some of that PLA, PVA, if it didn't quite uh, completely purge the nozzle of one or the other, then I wonder, is it going to affect the outside surface finish of the, of the part? Or at the same time, is the PVA going to mix somewhat with the PLA of the actual model and leave gaps or holes or something? That's a good question. Um, I've now since increased my purge block size from 15 by 15 to about 22 by 22 millimeters. So just increasing it that little bit seems to work a lot better for purging. But I found actually the PLA PVA mixing made a really brittle concoction. But yeah, it might leave behind little pinholes in the part where there were the strings. But I'm not too worried about that. We'll end up seeing what happens. But definitely being that it's a mixing nozzle where both filaments come into one heat block and come out of one nozzle definitely makes things more interesting right if that if that answers that so i really don't know i've never done these kinds of prints before which is why i was really excited when jimmy got the a10m because it was like oh cool something that i've never done before but this would be really interesting oh jimmy do you need someone to come and spend some time at your house for a little while this would be great <laughs> yeah no he actually was saying you know well, if you got an A10M, would you use the thing? I'm like, I need to check if I have any space over where I'm renting. But I'm like, yeah, if I did have one, it would definitely get used. Because the way I see it is, I love the Moai, but being that I have to drive about an hour to get to my friend's house to use the thing, and also being that it takes a long time, being able to you know, create a decent FDM model wouldn't be a bad idea for prototyping because don't get me wrong the ultimaker does a good job but there's times where i've wanted to see if i can do it using a cheaper fdm machine because a lot of people go oh i'd love to be able to do really nice prints but i can't afford a resin machine so i'm thinking is this kind of a good go between gotcha or you don't count it. it's uh it's about 10 after 10 and i i really got to get my kids to bed before i get judged too harshly by the youtube community so i'm probably gonna have to get out of here it's all good, dude. It's it's getting late over here too. I'm I'm just waiting on the TiVo to finish so I can throw the last print of the night on there. But thanks again for coming on and hanging out. It has been absolutely awesome getting to talk with you and you know, just getting to hang out and talk 3D printing and teaching and everything. And it's it's been fun. No, it's been it's been an honor to be to be on the prestigious Calvin and Jimmy show. Let me tell you. Dude. Boy. It's it's been it's been awesome having you on here after all those times that my dad was like, You gotta have Mr. Carol Science on the show, you gotta have him on the show. And it's like, Well, your wish has been granted, old man. What do you think of it now? <laughs> I, I, there was a lot of hype, I guess. I hope I lived up to his expectation. <laughs> no, honestly, it's really all we ask for is just somebody who's cool, rolls with the show, and just keeps everything awesome. I mean, it's it's not that hard to do. Right. Well, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, if you guys, if you guys aren't subscribed to my channel, maybe pop over there and throw throw me a bone. I, I don't. I, I posted a video today for the escape room. You don't really need to watch that one because it's like five seconds long and it's just a clue. But, but uh, I try to do a lot of three D printing content with my classroom. I also do um, some different science lessons. I did one where I built some bulletproof plates out of stuff I made. I found at the dollar store. I do a lot of really fun little experiments. So. But let me, uh, let me link to your channel really fast in the chat so people can go on over and give you a um, give you a follow. But definitely, you know, check him out on social media as well. He definitely he's definitely doing some awesome stuff. And I think it's you know, if you know any teachers who are interested in three D printing, you know, is it cool if they get in touch with you? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I mean, in closing, I think you definitely should, you know, maybe come up with some Google Docs for just generic uses of 3D printing in the classroom and make them available to teachers who are interested in trying to bring that out there. Or, or if you want, I can even in my spare time come up with a couple of different, you know, ideas, just kind of like little, little, you know, um, 
ideas, if you will. A, a Calvin, a CDA Pinterest board. I like it. I like it. Yeah, you know, pretty much just, you know, something so that way people can go, hey, that actually seems like a good idea, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you go get those kids in the bath and get them to bed, dude. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No problem. Have a good night, man. Yeah. Bye. Okay, guys. Well, that was the Calvin and Jimmy show. Uh, Sans Jimmy with Mr. Carroll Science stepping in. It's been awesome. Um, if you guys want, I'll stick around for a few more minutes um, to answer any questions in the chat. And um, I'm just waiting on the TiVo to finish and the A10M to finish as well. So hopefully those will be done soon so I can get the other prints going on there and then head to bed myself. But um, it's been awesome. And thank you again to Jimmy for letting me crash in here and pretty much have free reign over the printers and stuff. It's been it's been awesome. I hopefully will get something going on the Ultimaker though because it's feeling a little bit neglected right now, but I'll, I'll work on fixing that. So we'll see. Oh, thanks, Wellbot, making me feel real welcome. <laughs> oh, man. But I think I'm going to head off at this point, guys. It's been awesome. Um, thank you again to ev all, like, I don't know, 12 of you at some point. Some new faces in the chat. The old guys, as always, you guys are awesome. You're totally what makes this possible. And I will see you guys next time on the Calvin and Jimmy show, which will probably be the same set. And then it'll be something new. Don't worry at some point. Um, yes, Wellbot. I'm in your house stealing your inner needs. Yeah, I know. Jimmy gave me the password, so it's okay, I think. <laughs> but thanks again to everybody who popped in. It's been awesome. And I will see you guys next time on the show. And as for the uh, sticker holder, FYI, that video will probably be coming out Sunday morning because Jimmy's going into work on Sunday and Saturday, we're probably going to take it pretty easy and I won't be able to get the video out then, but oh well, things are a little bit mixed up with the scheduling at this point, but you know, got to do what we got to do and see you guys later. Whoops, wrong mouse.